Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the R Anime Podcast. My name is Sinris, and a day that's probably long overdue is finally upon us. We have been doing this podcast for like five years, at least, over 400 episodes, and we have never talked about Neon Genesis Evangelion. We have mentioned it in other episodes. We talked about it in our um, our recommendations episode and everything, but we have never really devoted the time to it just on its own. So it's time to finally right an ancient wrong. And here with me today to do that, we have Shock King eight oh seven. Hey y'all! Thanks for having me. Um, I think we're on. Epi- I think we're on two hundred episodes. So, <laughs> but I I like. Was it 200? I thought someone said 400 earlier. No, but I like the ambition. You know, uh, end of, uh, well, Evangelion as a whole is very larger than life. So let's just like double our life cycle. We have 400 episodes. <laughs> that is us. <laughs> uh, what's the name of the fucking website where we host all of our podcasts? Simplecast? On? Simplecast, that's one. Thank you. Anyway, uh, then also with me today, we have Comrade Kavrik. How's it going, Kav? Hey. Hey, hey everyone! I am I am so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It took us way too long to make that reference. <laughs> okay, no, you're right. This is going to be episode two hundred and nine. I don't know why I thought it was four hundred. I think that's just really funny because it's like it's not really <laughs> close. But I think we should. I'm just hoping, <laughs> not even really close. At hoping all. it's not cursing us that like we'll release this and you know to to you two hundred two thousand years from now when we're at episode four hundred. <laughs> Anyway, the point stands. Yeah. 200 episodes without doing an Ava episode is kind of ridiculous. Blasphemous. Um, because I think it's fair to say, would you two both agree with me that Ava is like the biggest, most important anime of all time? Yeah. Um. I mean, I think I remember, I think the one time we had a segment on Ava that was just dedicated to Ava was one of our recommendation episodes. And I think it was Tay talking about it. And they said, we live in a pre and post Evangelion era in terms of anime. And I yeah. think it's fair to say that, you know, you, you know, you could argue here and there, like what's the most important anime Astro boy, maybe um, spirited away. So maybe something else that I'm, you know, Gundam, you know, you could make your arguments, but I think you could say that Ava is one of, if not the most important, and it de- definitely changed the entire medium. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I so, also feel like... Oh, go ahead. Kat. I feel. I also feel like it's... Uh, like, the question that you posed before us, the most important, right? Yeah, I feel like it's the right. most important. Like, the number mm-hmm. one. Like, I... I uh, spawned some anime in my head, like, what else could it be? And I feel like in terms of just sheer significance and how inf- how much it influenced, uh, like, anime in general, and not only anime, but, like, the entire world, and, like, mm, how it influenced the Western media as well. And I feel like it's just mm-hmm. too, too much to bust up and just say it's uh, even number two for me at least. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. I think I think one could argue that it's no longer like the most influential in terms of like the stuff that's coming out today oh. doesn't owe as much directly to Ava as it does to some other shows I might actually, in the time since then. I might actually disagree with that, but I'll get into that later. Yeah. But um Okay. Yeah, but I think that's fair. I'm not sure what would be the one that would replace it, which is also why I'm inclined to say it's the most influential, especially of like, you know, the past 30 years. Because mm-hmm. as Cap was saying, it's like, okay, well, if it's not Ava, what what would the other one be? And I can't think of the other one, so. Well, I think that like, this is definitely continuing to agree with Tay's line about living in a pre-Ava and post-Ava world. Yeah. But, you know, like most of the shows that come out today, I think can directly trace their roots more directly back to like uh the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya or Sword Art Online <laughs> are probably like the two that started the trends that are the biggest things now. Yeah, yeah, let's go back with Ava. Let's just go let's go stick with yeah. Ava. Let's get the <laughs> but, <laughs> but like the industry mm-hmm. as a whole is definitely just like exists in the form it does because of what Ava did for it. Yeah, that's true. I, does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, for yeah. sure. 
Yeah. And I mean, just in terms of how signif still significant and big EVA is, we, ju we can just look at the the Force rebuilt numbers and mm -hmm. they are completely insane. It's 10 billion yen and uh, it's even more than Anna himself expected. So, yeah, it's a lot. Right. And it's still like their franchise, pretty much, yeah. So, for you guys then, given how huge of an existence Ava is within the anime sphere, it just kind of like looms over everything constantly. Mm -hmm. What was your experience with it um, as a person who consumes anime? Was it like influential on you too, or was it something you got to after you were already infested in the medium? Uh, so I guess I have a mini tan tangent story. I guess I have some lore to me watching Ava. Um, so uh, I got into anime at the my, essentially at the end of my junior year of college because um, I had, you know, what I call like my anime senpai, my friend who got me into anime. Um, so he got me into it and, you know, I was kind of getting a lay of the land like, OK, I'm already here. What do I watch? And I had already gone through like your Cowboy Bebop, your Ch Samurai Champloos, your Bacchanos. So I was making my way through it. And um, I was like, naturally, I say like, OK, what's your favorite? And then he says Neon Genesis Evangelion. He said it's, you know, the best portrayal of depression he's seen. And he suffers with uh, but still suffers. I'm assuming I'm not I'm not I'm not keeping track of his medical <laughs> records. But, um, you know, I, it, the best portrayal of depression and someone who had depression, he like found it found it really um, both inspiring and really authentic to the experience and port and feelings. So uh, I checked it out. I think it was my senior year and it was fall kind of around this time. Um, and at the time I had like seasonal depression. So I watched Ava and then was sent into like a downward spiral for a week. And I just like didn't want to leave my room, which doesn't really make sense now in retrospect because I do think it has an uplifting message. But yeah, so mm -hmm. I, it got me good. It got me good. I was in it. I felt everything. I felt like, yo, this is a once in a lifetime experience. I totally feel the message, the portrayal of everything, you know, the really deep dive psychological elements, like really tapped into something I didn't know that I felt. So it was a very powerful experience, but possibly more powerful, which is really funny in retrospect, is I watched End of Evangelion and the Nisei Monogatari toothbrush scene within the same week. So... <laughs> <laughs> like, don't, I don't know what I was doing. College is just a, a wild time. Um, I think I also had the wrong reactions to both the I'm so fucked up scene and the toothbrush scene because I was like offended at the toothbrush scene, but I should have laughed at it. Whereas I laughed at the I'm so fucked up scene because it was so ridiculous. So um, I didn't even have the right reactions to both scenes. So I was just that down bad, that, that in the corner. But um, I... Hey, you were you were still new. I was still new. This was like under twenty anime completes. And I would just and I'm I, surprised and I would you just laugh at both scenes, right? That early. Well, my sorry. What did you say, Gav? And I would just laugh at both scenes, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have to. Well, I'm making my way. I have to rewatch Nisei soon, but um, yeah. So hopefully, I, I'll. I think I'll laugh at that one now. It's sh sheer ridiculousness, but um, yeah. So it was like first. Top 20, both of these were his favorites, and we both watched them together. So we watched two of the weirdest anime scenes together, and we're like, and I'm like, bro, what the fuck? He's like, yeah, hasn't, he's like, just laughing at me. So, um, <laughs> so it was a wild time, but I think I, you know, grew to appreciate it more and more over time. But, um, I've always had it as like part of my favorites, but not really like, it's not really like my top one or like a very like, you know, top one, top two series. I think there are some like very small elements that keep it from being like, you know, for me being like the number one Ava fan, you know, like I'm not like repping it like it's I'm not repping it like it's my city. Um, I guess you could say some absolute territory between it and my high favorites, but I rewatched it recently again and I appreciated it just as much with the. Uh, a few new takeaways that we can talk about later. But so, very powerful experience, very fantastic anime. Um, I d did not go into a deep depression after watching it a second time. So I, I think I had the right responses this time. Very cool. Kev, how about you? Um, I feel like I mentioned it just earlier in the podcast, but 
Um, one of the previous podcasts, yeah. But uh, mm. I, one of my friends told me that uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion is like this kind of sacred cow of uh, anime. Is that you need to appreciate it only when you're kind of familiar with the medium. So I waited patiently and managed to make uh, the series my 100th anime. And wow, nice. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I watched it and uh, enjoyed it plenty, actually. And uh, I can't say I was a really big fan of it in general, but uh, it just felt a bit alien, I suppose I would say. Just in general experience, maybe because of I didn't really watch that much anime from that period of time, like 90s. Uh, and uh, just the direction of Anna, as well as it, it's kind of trippy, kind of um, artistic, and uh, it kind of threw me out of the loop as well. And I felt like it's a very interesting series, very... I felt like I kind of understood what is going on there, but I can't say I really fully appreciated it, I'd say. Um, and just recently, like this year, I rewatched it again because all the rebuilds are out. And uh, I, I would say I appreciate it more in what it tries to do, but at the same time, I feel like its flaws are as well more apparent to me. And in general, I'm not the biggest fan of Eva. It, I'm, it's not my top 10 series, probably not even my top 50 series in gen- overall. But uh, I'm still I still liking it plenty for what it does for the for what it's doing for how much it influenced the anime in general and for some aspects of it. It just I feel like some other uh, details are a bit lacking. But again, we can probably talk about it later. Cool. Yeah, I think I watched it um, right around the cusp of the time when I was getting deep into shows you know when i was at the peak of like just churning through all the old classics that everyone says like oh you've got to see these um i think still within my first hundred but but not by too huge of a margin would be my guess um it's funny reflecting back on the first time watching it after having just finished a rewatch in the last couple of weeks that it left a really strong impression on me, but I don't think I actually remembered very much about it in the long run. Um, You know, especially I was talking to you about this a little while ago, Shaw, but there's a big stretch of episodes towards the end of the TV series that I had just completely forgotten existed yeah, yeah, entirely. Yeah. Uh, and then when I was watching End of Ava, I was thinking about like, okay, I know there's like, there's the I'm so fucked up scene, and but then there's also like the Asuka fight scene. What happens in between those? Asuka is like a comatose. How does she get back into the Ava? Like, What's anything that's happening before the third impact begins? I did not remember any of the actual events of that movie, aside from just like a few iconic snapshot scenes. Um, So getting back into it and perceiving it again was a, a weird experience that I think like my interest in Ava as like a story kind of went down on the rewatch mm-hmm. but my appreciation of it as like a, a piece of art went way up to the point that they kind of bounced each other out and my my score remains pretty much exactly the same as what it, what it was yeah. um yeah me too <laughs> it was one of the the weirder rewatch experiences that i've ever had yeah i mean i think we rewatched it kind of similarly and it's kind of like what you also you said, Cav, where it's like, yeah, the strengths are more apparent to me, but then some apparent weaknesses 
also were more apparent. And it sounds like we all had that similar experience where I've seen people kind of go, I feel like when most people rewatch it, they kind of have an extreme reaction where they're like, oh yeah, now I appreciate it. Favorite of all time. Or they're like, you know what? Maybe this wasn't as hype as I thought it was the first time around. So I feel like we were all kind of like, yeah, so we rewatched it and it was pretty much the same, if not a little tiny better. So <laughs> that's cool that we're consistent. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I th- totally feel you with like, I think I re- was thinking back to it and me- I think the first time I watched it, I had this idea that like the first half kind of felt like normal, episodic, you know, everything is everything is going according to plan. And then the second half just kind of like dissolves and becomes like this psychological analysis where like everything is more introspective. It's a lot slower paced. Everything is a lot more, you know, experimental and wild. But um like watching it now, I'm like, okay, so they aren't really that different first half to second half. Like, yeah, it does get more no, psychological. It does get a bit more like, you know, it does get a bit more experimental. But I'm like, the seeds were planted from the start for it to go in this direction. And I think part of the things that make up the Ava and it feels so like daunting as a, you know, property to discuss is how much of it is like you just talk about Ava as a TV show that is animated that existed and, you know, all the elements like we would a normal show versus the lore of Anno of like, you know, the rumors that are true or not true stuff that's been confirmed through interviews or not, like everything behind the scenes, his mental state, his influence, the fan impact. It's like they're both intertwined in a way that you can't completely overlook. So it's kind of tough because it's like, so we have the actual TV show, A, B, and C, that happens. Here's what we think. But then it's like, okay, but what about Anno? Like, what about everything behind the scenes that made it such a, like, I don't know, mythological entity? Yeah, saying mythological feels very right there. Not just because of, you know, like, the subject matter and the religious Mm -hmm. tones of the whole show, but also just because it's become so legendary as an existence itself that I feel like understanding what Ava is about is just as much about understanding its position within like Japanese society and culture Mm -hmm. and like the position that it held in the nineties as it is about anything that just happens in the series. Yeah. 100%. You know, like there are the, the shots in end of Ava that are just like like real camera footage of people sitting in a movie theater and that's like actual footage of people yeah. going to see the premiere yeah, it's, of uh, like uh, Death the Death Rebirth, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I feel like this meta commentary is, is especially apparent in the rebuilds overall mm-hmm. because they're mm-hmm. a bit different and they also in a way it's how we rewatched Eva from a different place from a different perspective it's the same with anna who made rebuilds from a different place and different perspective basically Mm -hmm. redoing the same and i should that's a real quick kev i should mention because i should have mentioned this earlier but i forgot we're only going to be talking about the original series and end of eva on this episode we will in the future be having another episode specifically about the rebuilds we will Um, rebuild the podcast and and (laughs) we will rebuild the podcast and do it all over again uh, because the final rebuild is finally out after so so long yeah never thought it would happen it's like that meme like Mm -hmm. didn't think we'd find ourselves here like right yeah anyway go go on kev no i'm just saying that uh yeah the kind of overarching overarching meta commentary of uh evangelion is is lasting and it started back in 94 five right and it's still going Mm -hmm. on basically and um yeah it's it's hard to underestimate how uh influential it is i guess that's what that's what i'm trying to say basically yeah so here's an interesting question for you guys Mm -hmm. that kind of popped up for me the other day when i was re-watching end of eva um I was texting with my girlfriend, who is not an anime watcher, um, and I just said, oh, I was, like, finishing my rewatch, I was watching End of Ava, um, 
and she was asking me about it um and i she she said at one point like choose for me would i like it and i was like <laughs> that is so impossible to answer yeah like it's i said it's undeniably one of the most iconic and influential pieces of media of the 90s but it's pretty polarizing despite its huge popularity and i'm not sure how someone without any familiarity with anime would think of it um uh is it about the series or the movie or in general uh i was talking about the the movie especially the but movie. just the series in general yeah because that's two totally different situations too because it's like <laughs> oh will you like the series will you like the first half of the series how will you feel about the ending of the first series and then how will you feel about end of evangelion so it's like you know will you be along for the ride all of it or will you get off at certain points because it gets too out there or a bit too like you know just a bit too ava for you um th- right that's a fantastic question and one i've asked well, I've asked myself for other people as well, because, you know, I think there are a lot of people who think that, like, Ava can do no wrong because it's, like, their all-time favorite and it's connected with them in a way that, like, no other media has, which I totally get. But, you know, mm-hmm. we can't we can't bring it up without mentioning, like, how polarizing it is, like, how it is a – it still kind of is a love-hate series. Like, you'll still see people, like, 30 years later being like, I don't get it. I think it's ass. Like, I don't like the series – fell apart last two episodes they have no budget they just started drawing like squiggly lines like it may i don't get it crayons (laughs) yeah yeah like so i mean i'm not saying that your girlfriend would think like that but it does really depend on like how people engage with media and just like their personal preferences because i've had that with right i've had that question with my dad a lot because uh my dad was like looking at some list of like top 30 best uh, sci-fi shows and uh, above like a bunch of his favorites was Ava at number nine. And I'm like, well, dad looks like you might have to check and it out. this wasn't about <laughs> anime. This was just about like, yeah, just in, like, just like sci-fi, just in sci-fi in general. It was number nine above a bunch of popular ones. I forget. I have the, I have it on my phone somewhere, but like this was like anime and just um, live action TV shows. So like it'll be on the same number nine on the same list as like, you know, Star Trek, like Babylon, I don't, I don't think Wars. Babylon 5, it was on Battle the list. Star Galactica. Star, Battlestar Galactica, that's what I was thinking of, uh, Firefly, like yeah. all of the big ones. And Ava was at number nine. I was like, well, dad, I don't know what to tell you, like one of the most influential of all time. Ha ha ha. So, <laughs> so I've been trying to get him to watch it, but he's definitely, and he can definitely be like very into like experimental media, but like, I don't know if Ava would be that one. Like, I don't know if he'd get it. So, I mean, it's, like, such a good question. Like, you have to know the person more than you need to know Ava. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good way to put it, yeah. Uh, Now that you're talking about it, I just realized that I never recommended Eva to anyone, I believe. Because either people have already seen it and have an opinion on it, or they're probably just not ready for it. And I do not recommend it to (laughs) them, basically. And uh, I, in this situation, I'd probably just say that, yeah, sure, it's one of the most influential series of all time, and you probably need to get familiar with it. But uh, approach it at your own risk, and do not rush it, just uh, be aware that it's a pretty out there, serious, polarizing one. And uh, try to approach it with an open mind, and... Uh, that's kind of it and uh, there is no really any prediction on how it's going to go because i feel like there is all very much depends on your suspension of disbelief especially whether you believe in Cindy from the beginning and whether you kind of are riding along uh, with his journey through his adolescence basically and uh, if you buy it, yeah, then you can get through all the plot stuff, basically, that Eva throws at you. But if you do not believe in the Hedgehog Dilemma and stuff, then you're probably just going to be skeptical all the way till the end and dislike it. Well, here, here's a question for you on that front, Cav, is how important do you think, like, understanding what's happening in Eva is to like appreciating Ava. Understanding 
Oh, is it? Because, is this where we're know, going to talk about the plot? I feel like it's not. I feel, I feel like I feel like it's not important. We don't. We don't have to. I feel like it's not but important. I have I, like, known some people who have been like, mm-hmm. yeah, it, like this show doesn't make any sense. Like, mm-hmm. how does anybody watch this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I feel like it doesn't. And act. it's hard to argue against that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I agree. <laughs> some hardcore Eva fans probably would try to argue, but. Oh, Those would be know. the same Ava fans who link you 10 essays when you're done to be like, okay, you didn't get it. Go do the required reading. So it's like yeah. in one in one hand, they're like, yeah, you could totally get it after the required reading. But these 10 people watch these videos, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I feel like it's not required, actually. Like understanding the story of Eva, mm-hmm. it's not that required. Uh, like you can probably piece some things together uh, if you're like attentive. But understanding everything is not uh, is not what you're watching Eva for. So maybe it kind of depends on once again your uh, expectations. And if people are trying to go into it expecting a strong plot storyline, they're probably going to be disappointed. And I feel like I feel like this. The anime itself poses rather well as a character drama, but I guess some people just do not really see it anyway and try to go for the story. But anyway, to like answer the question, I don't think no, I don't think it's really it's really required. So yeah. Yeah, I agree with. I think the not following the plot isn't as required as understanding Shinji because I think. Shinji is a lot more polarizing than the pl- actual plot of, and like following the events because it really I think it really depends on if you can understand Shin- Shinji's dilemma or if you're one of the like stop crying get in the robot people. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Shinji's dilemma. The Shinji the dilemma. <laughs> the he- the hedgehog's Shinji if you will. <laughs> um yeah, it it was interesting for me on my rewatch because you know the thing i say about ava all the time and why it left such a huge impression on me um especially with end of ava was that i felt like when i finished watching that movie for the first time like my brain had just been splattered on the wall behind yeah. it. like it had burst my skull open i was just in complete awe at what i had just experienced and that feeling is so unique to Ava, I think. I At least I certainly can't think of anything else I've ever seen that had that sort of same profound effect on me. Um, yeah. yeah. And that's largely because I was just watching it in disbelief because I didn't understand what was happening. Yeah. Like, at least not the details of what was happening or really why it was happening, but I... I cared because I liked the characters and I knew that, you know, whatever was going on was just like <laughs> terrible. Um, and this time when I was rewatching, I tried very hard now that I like, you know, was familiar with the story to some degree to follow along with the plot mm-hmm. and the lore and everything, you know, like, what is the third impact? Is it the same thing as human instrumentality? Are those two different things? What does Sele actually want versus what <laughs> Gendo wants? Yeah. That kind of stuff. Yeah. And I felt when I was really dialed in on that, I was able to follow along with that without too much difficulty. Yeah. And But that took a lot of the fun out of End of Ava. Yeah. Um. I... It didn't. It didn't have anywhere near the same impact on me when I was like, "Oh yes, okay." This scene of like giant Ray like leaning back, collecting the souls of the world. This is what they're talking about when they say, "Oh, the chamber of Guff is opening." Yeah, yeah. I think. Like, oh, it's good that you. Yes. I'm glad you brought up the like the random like world building elements because I'd say that like Ava has good world building and that like it establishes the state of the post-apocalyptic setting and it has like 
it presents the world in an interesting way. But I think that's where I get tripped up is they just start mentioning so many random lore terms and they don't really explain them sometimes to me at all. So like you get tripped up on all the like, how many Lance of Longinuses are there? Like, what are they like? This person is from Lilith and the other person is from Adam. Adam. But like, that makes it special because most of them are from Lilith and Adam. It's so like, there's so many small terms that I think you can really get tripped up on as well as their like biblical um, counterparts that you're kind of trying to be like, okay, so like they're saying these two because that that's referring to like Adam and Eve, but then it's also the Avas. And then, so like, it's really easy to get tripped up on all that and kind of miss the forest for the trees. Whereas like, I think the second time around, I was trying to like pay attention to those, but I was also like, okay, time to push all that bullshit into the back and focus on the depressed people. Like, that's what we're here for. Like, oh, they're, they're just, they're not doing well. Every like every uh, relationship and communication channel is broken down. Everyone is just not doing well, and that's what was a lot of, a lot more important than like the small details surrounding them. Yeah, right. Yeah, I agree, and I feel like we all approach the uh, our rewatch from the same point of view. Basically, it's funny. Yeah. Um, and yeah, to go back to what Sinus has said, that it kind of a bit killed the fun of the series of the story to follow it alone. And I feel like it's the one reason is just because it doesn't really fucking matter in the end. Like it just mm-hmm. doesn't. It, it, like the the silly uh, idea, the silly uh, final goal, it just doesn't really tie that well into anything. Basically, they just want to create the third uh, impact, and that's kind of it. Like because they want to. Because they want to, basically. There is no real reason for it. Like, it's not stated in the plain text. It's not given. We can just guess that they just want to recreate the world as they see fit. That's kind of it. And there is no drama. There is no real tension here. They are just kind of there exist to drive the plot along. And that's it. And right. And yeah. it's, 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 not, it's not the point of the series at all. And... I feel like, yeah, sure. I actually, after watching um, it all, I actually read some essays, read some articles, tried to piece by piece attach everything together, and it kind of made sense. I kind of understand what is going on. I kind of understand the uh, every like uh, the idea behind angels, what they do, what they supposed to. Like symbolize and stuff, but like it just kind of um, my own agenda here to understand it, to try to understand it. But it doesn't really enrich my experience with the series in any like meaningful way, at least for me. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, which is kind yeah, of a shame. I... I I think I think it's kind of a shame, and that's why of the reasons why I don't really enjoy the story part of uh, Evangelion because it's kind of a bit a bit too random and with Anna trying to be cool referencing all this uh, Bible plots and uh, like random items like spirit on genius why what what is it supposed to do like why it appears literally for <laughs> one episode and it just goes away and like okay fine. Uh, what, what was that that you said? Ah, uh, Spear of Longinus? Oh, yeah. yeah you were, right. Okay, fine. That's his cross. Okay, fine. Yeah, sure. Just throw whatever you want and just name drop them. And that's, that's, that's literally it. It is really tough when you have, like, I'm going to say, like, a half-assed Catholic background. Because, like, I went to Catholic school, but, like, <laughs> I, I, you know, I didn't. I'm not a biblical expert, but, like, I know enough to know, a, like, a a Catholic reference or, a, you know, Christian reference. So, like, I'm I'm watching it and I'm not sure how much of it is, like, is this Eva mumbo-jumbo or did I just really not pay attention in school? Like, how much is what? <laughs> like, so I'm never sure how much of it is, like, okay, this is actually a very on-point, like, biblical reference to something versus, like, they really just be, they just be throwing terms out there. And that's why I think it's also so tough when you have so many different interpretations of everything to try and parse through how much of it is like, yeah, the Christianity references are all meaningful. They all have a purpose. They're all there. They all serve meaning versus 
the shit looked cool, so I threw it in there. You know, like, I'm sure there's some middle ground between the two, but it's really tough to parse through a lot of that, especially with, like, so many different translations, so many different, like, you know, mistranslated translations. So, like, you really kind of have to find your own way to try and figure out, like, okay, is this one reference, like, how meaningful is this? Or as we have kind of come to the conclusion, like, it really doesn't matter as much as long as you kind of get the feelings and conflicts of the characters, um, which I think is actually what makes it so interesting is, like, I think, I'm thinking back to one of the shots. I think it's in episode, I want to say it's either, it's in the, like, 18 to 21 stretch of the series because as a, oh, the stretch that we forgot <laughs> the existed. stretch we forget about that has like yeah. so many important episodes um and it's the ones no, it's actually it's actually like 21 to 24 okay that we forget entirely yeah but uh, yeah because i'm trying to remember it's after um I think that it might actually be, it might be 19. I might be, it might, it might actually be 19 because it's right after. The one I know for sure is that episode 18 is the one with Toji? where, with Toji. Yeah, so that's. And then, my... and then 19 is the one with like the angel that breaks into the geo front. Okay, that might be the one that I'm thinking of because I think 18 is now my new favorite episode on rewatch. I love that one a lot. We can get into that. But, um, so it's the scene of like, you know, Shinji's running away again, classic Shinji. And, um. He's, like, traumatized, understandably so, after the Toji thing. Like, every communication channel has broken down between him and the people he's living with. And, like, they didn't tell him about Toji. And then, like, Toji got, like, critically injured, whatever. And so he's kind of running away while an angel is attacking. And that's where he runs into Kaiji in the uh, watermelon field. And uh, mm -hmm. it's That's like, a great scene. Yeah, yeah, it's a great scene. And it does a great job of showing, like, the everyday life of Kaiji watering these watermelon and in the background it's like this po post-apocalyptic battle and i think yeah. like there's one shot of that and i'm like yeah so that's just ava that's ava it's like all these people trying to find their way in life trying to make connections trying to understand themselves better in the with like the world ending in the background so right. i think yeah. it's kind of like you realize your priorities along the way are yeah, the friends we made along the way are more important than the angels we fought along the way yeah. In this episode of Linkin, by yeah. the way, yeah. That one scene as just like an encapsulation of what Ava's about, I hadn't really thought about that, but I think that's a, a good interpretation. I like that a lot. Thank you. Two rewatches in the making. I was like, oh, we found it. We found the watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm glad you said on rewatch that episode 18 was your favorite because that, that was my favorite the first time and it remained so Let's after, go. Uh, Let's after go. the rewatch. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, for me that was really the point where I like when the dummy plug like forces Shinji to crush Toji's capsule. Oof! I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Now I get why people say this is like the best show of all time. Yeah, I was like, it was it was pretty good, but like now I get it. Yeah, there's so many small scenes. Well, not small scenes. That's a big scene. But there's so many like casually very traumatizing scenes in this series that when you really like in the moment you're freaking out about but when you step back and think about it you're like okay this is a very graphic very brutal series and it's funny like when you think about Ava maybe you guys think about it, maybe I'm just like I'm just slow with this but like you know when I think of like brutal and graphic I think of something like Berserk where like the violence is in your face like you could not avoid it if you tried but like you think about it and a lot of the psychological damage that damages that go on in Ava or like I'm not necessarily saying berserk level but they really leave an impact Ava is is very disturbing to watch yeah, yeah. it is you know it definitely has its graphic moments but mm -hmm. they're they're few and far between yeah it's just it's just really uncomfortable to take in a lot of the time like the one shot you showed me with um the one you sent me recently where I think it was in, it's in our favorite stretch, the Bermuda Triangle stretch of Ava episodes we forgot. <laughs> I think it's episode 23, yeah. the angel that's just like a big halo that um, infects unit 00 and then forces her to self-destruct. Yeah. Um, the one where, when Ray 2 dies, but yeah. The one with Ray and then like, it's like yeah. growing, the, it's like, is it Ray or the angel growing on Shinji's Ava? And it's, 
Yeah, it's like the angel merges with Ray and then starts merging with Unit Zero Two, and like all of these tiny rays start growing out of Shinji's hand. Who would have thought that would be some foreshadowing for a uh, you know <laughs> some foreshadowing <laughs> yeah. for End of Ava? I'm gonna send it to Cav because like he probably remembers, but you know mm-hmm. you gotta see it in action. Yeah, like those things are like okay. The it's one thing to be have complete autonomy while you're attacking something and you know maybe the fight's not going your way or it's getting really brutal but the whole like you know your father is controlling you while you're smashing an angel that took over your friend pilot friend's robot and then you find out afterwards that it's your friend and like you're still your hand is still the one that like crushed him but you couldn't control it like the psychology behind that is just like you know very running away from the robot tier i think that's very worthy of like getting out of there yeah yeah. So I want to talk about Shinji real quick because I'm pretty sure I'm preaching to the choir when I say that, like, he gets way too bad of a rap. Um, yeah. Um, and that he yeah. he's not just, like, coward baby man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, just describing all the events he's gone through and, like, you know, the, you know, the ca- a day in the life of Shinji is not, is no joke. Um, I think it's kind of like a turning point of, you know, kind of a turning point in terms of, like, I don't want to, I don't know about like masculinity, but like, you know, what do we view as a compelling, you know, a compelling main character? What is true strength? What is sympathetic? You know, what's relatable? What's understandable? Um, You know, just like everything, he's kind of a cultural reset in various ways. And I think it's, you kind of either get it or you don't. But I think what's interesting is that like, you know, Ava, I'm going to bring up the D word. We've gone a long way without bringing up the D word. Um, you know, Ava is always brought up in terms of like the deconstruction elements. And um, I always have like, I have my own gripes on the idea of deconstruction. So like we can get into that later or not, whatever. But uh, Shinji is probably the core of what people think of in terms of the deconstruction elements. You know, it's calm. I guess people believe that like, you know, in a lot of the, you know, teenager chosen to fight the big monsters and a robot and they become a hero and they're cool and stuff and they're like super excited for it and shinji is the opposite of that he does not want any part of it he doesn't want that responsibility and this is what you know if a 14 year old with daddy issues actually was forced to pilot a robot off the cuff while the world is ending having no training this is what they would actually be like which you know highlights the emotional core of the series and it either kind of like works for people or it doesn't, but I think it made it possible for really complex, interesting characters to come, you know, bef- bef- I guess I think they, I mean, complex characters existed before Shinji, but more characters who were <laughs> as, you know, introspective and interesting and vulnerable as Shinji. Yeah, I, I think what something that struck me on this rewatch was that I feel like the the Shinji discourse kind of tends to go back and forth where they're mm-hmm. like the Shinji haters who are like, yeah, he doesn't do anything but whine. He's mm-hmm. totally pathetic. Um, and then you have the Shinji defenders who are like, well, yeah, but like you would be too in that situation. Yeah. And that's what makes him good. But what struck me this time is that both of those sides are kind of not accurate mm-hmm. to what the character is actually like because he he isn't like that past the beginning of the show yeah you know he he has ups and downs but over the course of the series he comes around and gets pretty into piloting the ava and doing his job and everything yeah you know in the bit right up leading up up until the toji episodes um it's like his test results are off the charts when they're doing like the synchro- synchronizing with the Avas and stuff. He's like been winning all the fights while the other two have been kind of getting their asses handed to him. Mm-hmm. It's like Asuka is like having this emotional crisis because she's like you know Shinji's a loser but he's like so much better at this than I am. Um, and there, during a fight against one of the angels, I don't remember which one um Misato gives her some orders to do something and she's like oh well why don't you just like make Shinji do it since he's so good at piloting the Eva yeah and Misato's like Asuka will you just shut up and follow the orders and then Shinji's like no you're right I will do it yeah yeah I remember that (laughs) 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, he, like, gets into it. He, like, gets over his shit for a good stretch of time there in the yeah. series. And then it, it's just when Gendo forces him to murder his friend. Yeah. That, you know, his emotional state then takes the deep dive. And then when, again, he's forced to murder Kaworu, that he really goes off the deep end. Yeah, for understandable reasons. Yeah, I think it it is really interesting because I think it comes down to like how much empathy and understanding can you have for him? Because there is that level of like, you know, both sides are pretty presumptuous. The one side that's like, well, he's a bitch. If that was me, it would be different. And the other side's like, no, actually, if you were in that position, you would be just like him. And it's like, okay, taking us out of the equation how understandable can we, un how much can we understand Shinji, the actual character in that position? And, you know, as you said, it's like, he really does do a lot. He really has, you know, very justifiable reasons for every mental breakdown. And it just got, like, everything makes sense to me with Shinji. I think he just really makes sense as a character. And I think, um, you know, a character trope I've kind of grown a bit tired of in media, not from Ava, from other series, is that kind of like, the character who has depression is like their main personality trait. I will not call out mm -hmm. any names that you you guys can all probably think of at least one. But like, uh, I think pe like thinking of Shinji, like, yeah, th he spends a lot of time being depressed, but he also does spend a lot of time not being depressed. He spends a lot of time like trying to make friends, hanging out with his friends, you know, doing things outside of just piloting Ava, you know. He does have his own sense of character beyond the conflicts and the emotional conflicts. So... I think they really do a good job with him in making, you know, the hard hitting moments feel very depressing and, you know, fitting, but also giving him some brevity in between. I feel like, yeah, and, and that duality is reflected in the show itself, too, mm -hmm. with Toji and um, the other friend, Ida. When, you know, Toji is first introduced, he's like... <laughs> pissed off at Shinji because Shinji is the Ava pilot and he like beats the shit out of him. Yeah, because his sister because, got hurt in the fight. Because yeah. his sister got hurt in the fight. Um, and there are a couple scenes of like Ida and Toji watching like like watching Shinji fight angels together and they're like this guy fucking sucks at this. Like yeah. what, <laughs> what, what is his problem? Why is he so bad at just piloting the robot? Um, and then once they are like forced to like get to know him and there's the the episode where you know they get like stranded out above ground while the fight is going on mm -hmm. and they have to like take shelter inside the cockpit of the Ava with him and they see like how horrible this experience is for them that kind of stops yeah but then even later once unit uh zero four is being delivered to nerve Ida is like finds Misato and is like let me pilot the Ava I want to do it yeah. And not knowing that Toji has actually been selected as the pilot and the fact that he's going to be piloting it is like this horrible thing for him. Yeah, that was really interesting because it kind of felt that was episode three, by the way, where they get sucked into the to the robot um, three or four. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was kind of like a wake up call to the audience to be like, here are these people who were criticizing him who are, you know, they're a lot more dynamic, bolder kids his own age. And even they're traumatized by it. So like. Here's the wake up call. Like this shit sucks. Like this is not this is not dope shit. So <laughs> it's interesting they have that, and some people don't like make the connection that like piloting the Ava, which is connected to your nervous system, and you can feel what the Ava feels. So when it breaks your the Ava's arm, it feels like your arm is getting broken. Is not very fun. This is not lit. <laughs> like <laughs> right. It's an interesting I don't know blind spot. Uh, to go back a bit to your point, Sha, about uh, Shinji being a uh, depressed character and uh, him being different from other depressed characters, I feel like the main one of the main reasons why Shinji is so compelling, especially compared to other similar archetypes, is because in these other similar archetypes, these kind of sad boy characters, they are being rewarded for being sad. Mm -hmm. and not doing much with their life other than whining and complaining and like doing nothing basically but in Shinji's case he 
is not being rewarded. He is mm -hmm. instead being punished even more because he has no other choice or way. He cannot. He tries to run away so many times, but he cannot because he has nothing else to do, essentially. And this right. kind of uh, very sad, tragic situation is what makes him a real like dramatic character for me and for many people as well i guess and uh, he still because he he's, he sees no other way he tries to his best to actually kind of come into terms to people around him with misato with ray with asuka and even then he's kind of being rewarded but not really it still feels like it's all in the realm of possibility or what could happen with these characters without being completely ridiculous like off the charts everything that is ridiculous in eva is in the plot is in the story but what mm -hmm. is happening with these characters is very grounded and like real and that's probably why Sinji is so polarizing as well uh like mm -hmm. people so divided on him is because he's so people can relate to him essentially and <laughs> yeah. sees, sees their flaws in him and uh, kind of like no one likes when this kind of uh, traits are being like showcased to them like so colorfully right and they, they did not like it they did not appreciate it and that's why they might have a kind of different reaction to him yeah, that's really true. Um, I was thinking about it. It's like, even when Shinji wins, he kind of loses. So, um, yeah. right. Yeah, I agree. Like, because I was thinking back to it, especially on this rewatch with like, especially like, let's say Asuka's treatment of him. Like, even when their relationship makes some progress towards being kind of tangentially positive, it's like, it's still every other word is an insult. You know, like he's constantly getting berated by Asuka for breathing wrong. Um, Miss Atoho is like probably the nicest person to him, but she's still his commanding officer. So there's still like some unbalance there. And, um, and then there's Ray who, you know, <laughs> no, no <Ray>. warmth there <laughs> as, as yeah. intended. And so it's kind of like he gets his two friends and those are kind of it. And, you know, they have a good dynamic. He's not getting bullied by them like he does with Asuka, but like he really is never really celebrated that much outside of work when he has when he does a good job in terms of like destroying the angels or having like a really high test score so there's so many conditions to human praise for him that it's like right. he's just getting his ass beat all the time emotionally and physically yeah i think my favorite element of the whole series is probably the relationship between shinji and asuka mm-hmm because it, it's just like so messed up, so, but in such a I, I don't know, just like sadly relatable way um, yeah. that it it almost feels at so many points in the story like they could be good for each other, yeah, almost, almost, yeah, but never actually they're they're not capable of like bridging the gap between the way that they interact with the world like i'm thinking of the scene where they kiss mm -hmm. which i had completely forgotten actually happens <laughs> yeah um it does happen but i think it does happen Asuka is, <laughs> Gab is like yeah, don't it, forget <laughs> it does. don't forget don't forget the incredible 10 out of 10 Asuka line. What's wrong? Are you afraid to kiss a girl on the anniversary of your mother's death? Yeah. <laughs> that's, their yeah. li that's their relationship in a nutshell. Like, why won't you yeah, kiss right. me on the anniversary of your mother's death? Um, but, yeah, it's, it's something that they clearly both want, but they're they're too repulsed by each other's personalities mm -hmm. to like connect yeah. on the level that they want to be able to connect on. Yeah. I think, I think it's, it's fascinating. It's so good. It's yeah. It's that. like, huh? go on. Oh no, go ahead. I know. Go on. 
I didn't have anything. It was just a long、uh, way of agreeing. <laughs>、okay. I'm just saying that this is basically the hedgehog's dilemma that、uh, they were talking about in episode four. And、uh, yeah, they are pretty much repulsed by each other and、uh, they just do not understand each other in like, a fundamental way. Uh, Tinji does not understand what Asuka wants from him, and、uh, Asuka does not understand what Tinji exactly wants from her as well. So they just constantly taunt each other、uh, with their presence, especially since they cannot avoid each other, since they're living like, under the same roof. And、uh, right. yeah, it's just、uh, like they have probably they have some kind of physical attraction to each other. And.、Uh, Maybe there is some kind of women's pack of basic respect, but not, not more, especially since, again, they just do not really get each other. And、uh, since, they think, since they believe that Asuka is just this kind of flashy girl with no substance who is just、uh, trying, to, this, trying to insult him as much as possible and、uh, only cares about herself. Which is kind of true to an extent, but at the same time, Asuka wants I, other people to see her for more than she is and、uh, appreci- appreciate her more as well. And,、uh, yeah, and, and that's like the great irony of it, right?、Mm-hmm. Is that they are exactly the same. They want exactly the same yeah, thing. Yeah,、mm-hmm. yeah. And,、uh, yeah. And Asuka. Believe Sinzi is just this kind of whiny boy who has no ambition, who has no real purpose in life. And、uh, again, that's kind of true. But at the same time,、uh, Sinzi wants that praise, Sinzi wants that kind of more.、Um, I don't know how to say it even.、Uh, kind, kind of. Kind of approval, right? Yeah, approval, approval. Approval is a good word, yeah. And.、Uh, Uh, Asuka just. Asuka gives it in a very. I believe she praised Tinzi like a couple of times still throughout the series. But、yeah. uh, that's, that's, that's kind of it. And、uh, Baka Tinzi just cannot really live <laughs> up to expectations of Asuka no matter what. Right. Yeah. Yeah.、Um, I guess glad we got to.、Uh, my favorite character is Asuka. Oh. First time around, second time around, every time around, Asuka <laughs> for me, because、um, I like the way that she is presented as someone who is also very depressed and hurt and just like fundamentally broken as a person, but the way she lashes out and expresses those feelings are just so like ridiculously fucked up and so, so <laughs> insane. Just,、um, mm. you know, like as you were saying, she wants. Shinji's attention and approval. So, but she wants Shinji to give it to her, like, without her prompting. So, I guess her way of doing that is to, like, bully him into submission. But then once he submits, she's like, well, that's still not what I want. So, like, no one can、yeah. win with Asuka. It's so, it's so frustrating, but so authentic to just, like, the teenage experience, especially someone who has been through everything she's been through.、Yeah. So, it's like, it's so. Difficult to watch, but it is interesting just the the insane dynamic she has with everyone in the cast. She's just like, you know, fireworks in a bucket, like just make, make, forcing everyone else <laughs> to react to her. And it's,、uh, what was I thinking about? I was thinking, I had this one thought, it'll come back, but、um, yeah, she's just. Well, we were talking earlier about like the sad boy anime protagonists、yeah. who have no personality except for being depressed all the time. Yeah. And. It's funny that that is kind of like our image of, you know, like depression in media、mm-hmm. is so often just like this person who is just like mopey all the time. Yeah. But Asuka is such a different, but, you know, just as real and just as relatable、um, expression of like what a person who's like severely depressed can ask. Can act like. Yeah. yeah. Just with a different kind of expression, not like being, being、right. violently、uh, depressed. Right. Yeah, I, that's what I love about it too is that,、um, you know, is just like Shinji is kind of the deep, well, I guess using the D word again, deconstructive idea of like what a 
the pilot, main pilot should be. I like that Asuka comes in and she's the only person any only pilot who is like genuinely enthusiastic about the job, but that's also because that's the only reason she has for living. Like she needs that kind of she needs to succeed at something. She needs some kind of self approval. She almost you could argue she needs that kind of validation from Nerve uh, more than Shinji does because you know Shinji just essentially kind of wants his dad to notice him and praise him like he wants to finally get that approval and recognition from his dad that he never did whereas Asuka is just kind of looking for it anywhere like anywhere she could get it she needs some kind of validation for her life and existence after you know the traumatizing upbringing she had with her mom you know you know her mom thinking that she's a doll and you know trying to kill them both the casual you know casually but uh casual thing, so yeah. yeah so it's so it's so raw just to see her try to get any scrap of validation or attention she can get from anyone. And, you know, she gets that surface level attention, especially when she shows up and she's very flashy. And I think that sustains her a bit. But then she kind of, once she gets to know more people, it's like, she just wants something from them. And you see her like pulling teeth with rain, like to try and get anything out of her, which is why I think she tries to instigate her into like, you know, giving her some kind of react reaction, which Ray is just incapable of giving. And then she just tries to get something out of Shinji. So she's like constantly just trying to fire everyone up by being the most miserable person of all time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really interesting to see how she interacts with Misato too, mm -hmm. especially where Kaji is involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because she spends so much of the series like trying to get Kaji to want to have sex with her. Yeah. And he is always just, like, exclusively, like, no, you're 14, I'm, like, 30, I'm not interested. Yeah. yeah. And then once he, like, rekindles his relationship with Misato, and Asuka figures that out, she gets, like, violently jealous of Misato. Yeah. That, you know, uh, Kaji is interested in her, but but not in Asuka. Not yeah, only violently so interested, but also it just all projects on the fucking scenes again. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Right. And that's when she's like, well, Shinji, we should make out. And Shinji's like, what? Why? And she says, because I'm bored. Yeah. 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 yeah I think, you know, Ava does such a great job of showing like the very messy aspects to relationships, but then also, you know, just something as natural as like a teenage girl wanting to be recognized as a woman. So she, right. you know, Kaji won't recognize her as a woman because she's not a woman. So, you know, <laughs> as messy as Ava is, it's cool to see an adult not treated 14 year old like an adult. That's kind of lit. So um, so she turns to Shinji and she wants him to recognize her as a girl. And like, ironically enough, Shinji is attracted to her. He is interested, but like her own actions prevent that intimacy that she's kind of looking for but mostly like she thinks she's looking for because she wants some kind of validation so right Hedgehog yeah, and dilemma. then after they kiss she's just like she just like storms off and she's like what what happened she's like well you're stupid yeah. <laughs> so it's like what is he supposed to think like what is anyone supposed to think in this situation yeah. right so confused but what's probably the most fucked up thing or probably the funniest thing it depends on how you look at it, is that Asuka, as well as Rei, I guess, if we bring her into conversation, are so, so popular, like, as waifu material among, like, weeps, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even though they are so dysfunctional as human beings. And, yeah, like, it kind of makes you think what, what people even look into the characters, like, what do they appreciate in them, and what makes them feel like they are this kind of waifu material because Asuka is everything but not that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's very weird. I mean, it's so weird to think about because I think there's also that kind of intention to show like, here's what like your waifu tropes would look like if they were actually real people. Like, here's how broken a Sundari would be. Here's how broken a Dari Dari would be. Like, these are not normal functioning people. These are not normal behavior yeah. like there's nothing that you should want to, you should not want to be around these people you know like praise the character but like if there was an oscar in real life no one would want to be around her because they get abused on a regular basis like you right. know 
as attractive as a design she has. Like, no one would really put up with that as, like, an actual person. And that's why I've always been kind of, like, I don't know. Like, when I see Asuka get Asuka or Rey or, like, I don't know. When they, I see them getting, like, super waifu'd up, I'm, like, I think you kind of, I don't know, like, peace and love. I think you kind of missed the point. I think, like, we're kind of <laughs> going against the point of the series. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. Cyrus, who is your favorite character in the series? Um, that's a tough call. And because it's one of those things where, like, well, you can look at it like, who do I think is the most interesting character versus who do I enjoy the most, you know? Probably enjoys the most, um, yeah. That's, that's yeah. And the, my first watch, it was definitely Misato, mm-hmm. who I enjoyed the most. She grew on rewatch, um, for sure. And, but on rewatch, is like, I don't really like any of these people. <laughs> I no, I, that's not true. I think on rewatch, the one person who I like genuinely like as an individual, like if they were a real person, I would want to hang out with them is Kaji. Yeah. And even even Kaji is like kind of problematic. Yeah, he's kind of a <laughs> sussy baka. Yeah. Um. You know, like Ka- Kaji would definitely get me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they have the cameras of him and Misato like making out in the elevator. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But I, that's why I want to bring up Kaji because I I was really enjoying him mm-hmm. this this watch. Um, and it's, it's interesting how you can simultaneously be like definitely a piece of shit, but mm-hmm. also clearly the only person in the entire show who like has their life together. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah. He, he's the only one who knows what he's about, but he's also happens to be about, like, a quadruple agent. So he knows all four <laughs> sides of himself. Yeah, right. He He's, like, working three different sides of the conflict simultaneously, but he's also the only person who's capable of just, like, speaking his truth. Mm-hmm. Hmm. It's a very interesting character dynamic. Yeah, I feel that, too. Um, I think... You know, the interesting influence he has on, like, Shinji and then, like, his dynamic with Misato is very interesting. I think he is definitely really cool as, like, one of the sources of reason in the series. One of the wise voices from someone who's, like, you know, definitely flawed in his own right, which is interesting to see. Um, But I think it is he is, like, a very cool character to have. Just someone who's kind of, like, I know what I'm about, but, like... Might not be the most, uh, might not be the most wholesome thing, but at least he's like honest with himself, which is more than most characters can say in the show. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, his main goal is just to find the truth behind everything. That's why that's mm-hmm. one of the reasons why he became a double triple agent because he wanted mm-hmm. to find the truth behind it all, and he eventually uh, found death in trying to find the truth, and eventually it all. Uh, came to Misato all the information. So in a way, he succeeded, but uh, his again his fate as fate was pretty much every character in this show. It's kind of tragic. So yeah, yeah. He, I was sad. Yeah, it made he, me sad. Still, he, as we kind of is it implied, he lived a pretty much fulfilled life, and uh, in the end, he as well, made up with Misato, so, and it was pretty much his goal, I guess, as well, and it kind of ended, ended well here as well, mm-hmm. in a tragic way, but still, like, a fulfilled one, fulfilled relationship. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, he's a very, he's a very just good character in a good place in the series, so yeah, I like him a lot. Yeah. Cav, did you mention your favorite character? No, not yet, but on the first watch it was Asuka, just probably mm-hmm. because she, that's how colorful she was and how just charismatic as well. Uh, but on a second watch, I much, much more appreciate Misato, actually. Misato is probably my favorite character now in the series. Probably because I'm just older and I can appreciate <laughs> older women and like just older <laughs> yeah, perspective yeah. in her, general. Her adult struggles. Yeah. yeah. I just, do see that. 
yeah. with like a lot of lifelong fans who like you know the first time around they're like oh yeah like i can relate to shinji a lot and then the second time now that we're all older it's like yeah misato like I'm, this is really hitting a lot more and their their character arcs really like balance each other and like you know a very very fitting way so like i definitely see that um do you think when we're like 50 and have children will be like yeah you know i really get where gendo was coming from yeah. <laughs> they just have someone at Gendo every point Gendo. yeah Gendo had the i point. can totally see it they'll just be so bad i don't really i'm gonna be honest i never want to understand where gendo is coming from like i get it but like do not make me that down bad that i'm gonna cause like <laughs> the end of the world because my wife died but i'm also like ignoring my son for all of his life yeah yeah I, I noticed this time when watching End of Ava, though, there is a line when he's, like, he's dying after um, Ray has, mm-hmm. like, vored his arm. Yeah. Um, yep. And he's he's talking to, like, the instrumentality ghosts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's a good way of putting and it. And he says something about how, like, I pushed Shinji away because, like, I thought that he would be better off. Mm-hmm. not being around me. Yeah, it's essentially yeah. he apologized and regretted his actions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which makes sense. Um, yeah, because I think it was kind of like his aha moment, right, when he was about to die. Like, oh, I always thought I was so shit, but, like, I should have accepted Shinji as my son. It's like, yeah, no shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. surprise. Yeah. Um, I I do, did appreciate Gendo more as... A character, not just like as the most horrible father in history. Yeah, um, me, me too. I did. I yeah. I think if you're if you're really looking for it, you can kind of see that he is sort of in a weird way doing his best. Mm-hmm. It's just that he's just as terrible at expressing himself to other people as Shinji is. Yeah, yeah. That's what's Goes interesting about. Yeah, yeah. That's what's interesting about like every character at their life cycle is like they're all very lost. I mean, age group, whatever. Like, they're all very lost. They're just lost in, like, semi-different ways, but it all comes from the same core of, like, not knowing themselves, not really understanding themselves, and not feeling like they're able to form genuine connections. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. and uh, also, Ganda has a fantastic uh, flashback episode, actually. Like, I just kind of... Yes, that's true. Kind of uh, didn't really think about it before, but on rewatch, it just so good it's a really it gives lots of perspective into his character what yui meant to him his this is wife and stingy's mother and uh how it all started what adult meant and uh, why it all began because second impact was basically the beginning of the show the mm-hmm. start of it all or the end of it all of whatever you want to call it <laughs> the so, start and the beginning right. yeah, death yeah. and rebirth death and rebirth and uh yeah just such a fully realized episode and uh, yeah Genda is obviously kind of an antagonist of the series uh but still he kind of you can kind of understand his point of view you you do not accept it probably but yeah, uh, yeah but still it's like facing your own the, kid. There is one other character aside from Kaji who is just like a good person who has it figured out, and that's Fuyutsuki. Fuyutsuki, yeah. Fuyutsuki yeah. <laughs> is a great character, actually. I like him a lot. Like, yeah. he's just a very sane person, I guess, but he's just so devoted till the end to Gendo. Right. He just wants to see, see it all like till the end. But yeah. Uh, like he just... he's funny because he he like literally never does anything in the show. Yeah, <laughs> except he's Brent just he's just there because Gendo needs someone to monologue to. <laughs> kind but, of, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but he <laughs> does somehow just manage to like worm his way into your heart. Yeah, yeah. He's a comforting presence. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess going down the line of like. A pre not less appreciated characters than the main ones. Um, someone who always stood out to me, who I never like gave enough of my like I never pr- gave enough credit on both times is um, Rizuko. I always really liked her and her you know mini character arc. Um, Rizuko, yeah. 
Um, yeah, I I've like, never known what to make of her, so I'm curious what you have to say. Yeah, so one of the things I like is, um, you know, we all know that, like, the Ava character designs are simple but really dynamic and good. And one of the elements I really like about her design, which I'm, I'm not sure how many people are aware, so, like, I... You know, I dye my hair all the time, so I'm very aware of like different hair color and when and her hair is dyed blonde, which you can tell because her eyebrows are a different color. So like her eyebrows. Oh, I, that is that is very observant of you. I was going to say because she has a different hair color when she's a child in the flashbacks. Yeah, but. that too. So, but it's one of those <laughs> things I noticed maybe just from like I don't know. Like, you, I guess it, it might be a girl thing that, like, I notice people's hair color not being the same based on their eyebrows. Sometimes they do dye their eyebrows the same color, but a lot of times if you see someone dyeing their hair blonde and their eyebrows are a much darker color, you can tell their hair is blonde. Yeah, their hair is dyed. It's not the natural color. So that really keyed me into her character because it's a very, you know, that's a real life thing. But, like, why would they make her character design that? have that detail you know like why is that something they included and like there ray just has blue hair if they wanted a blonde character she could have just been blonde exactly like why would they go out of their way to make her eyelash her eyebrows a different color like why even have such bushy eyebrows in the first place and i feel like she's just like a good portrayal of like a different type of toxic than Misato. Like Misato mm-hmm. is kind of toxic, but like as we were we were talking about this in us, like you know how in the show they always kind of talk about how like you know Misato just kind of like uses men for her own you know you know her own self worth or like they kind of mention that like she sleeps around and stuff, but then we like never see any indication of that. Like the only person she really were shown her having like a romantic relationship with or any kind of relationship in that way is Kaji. So like. You wouldn't really think of her as like, I don't know, promiscuous if they didn't say it. Like she definitely seems sloppy and a drunk, but like I'm not getting the impression that she's going out and like sleeping with tons of dudes. Meanwhile, right, but like during the last two episodes of the main show, when everyone's having their like internal crises, yeah, they're saying like, "Oh, Misato, your big personal emotional issue is that you sleep around all the time." Yeah, and, and I, they're like, "Does she? Yeah, does she? Yeah, that." And it could be like. I think they say that and it's like, okay, maybe she to herself knows that like she's not really forming connection with men and she's just kind of using them. But like you don't really get that strong of an impression, at least for me. I didn't get that impression from her if they wouldn't have said something. Meanwhile, I think um, Rizuko is like in the background having like this really like just toxic relationship with Gendo, Gendo, where they're like sleeping together, even though like he slept with her mom. Like I forget if he slept with her mom while he was still with Yui. I forget. Whatever. It's, no, like, it's, it's after Yui dies. Yeah, after yeah, Yui yeah. dies. Yeah, so after Yui dies, and he's obviously, like, trying to find some solstice in, like, other women. And, like, it's just, like, so, it's so, like, background messy. Like, I love that how they, people are just having these toxic relationships that are not helping them or their self-worth. But it just kind of exists in the background. And it's not too, like, gratuitous. And she's just kind of, like, this interestingly toxic character who is both, like jealous of her she loves her mom but she's also like kind of trying to be her mom and trying to take that space that her mom filled both like in the organization and in like uh gendo's life so it's like she's her own person but she's also trying to be someone else and she's also still trying to understand her mom who made the maji computer system which has like three different parts to it which represent the three different sides of her mom and she just like can't fully understand because the motherly side is only one part of it. So she kind of has this like background journey to trying to background character arc, I should say of like just trying to understand her mom and this like ginormous computer system that she's in charge of. And one of my favorite scenes is in end of Ava. Where, I think it's in end of Ava. Yeah. I think it's end of Ava where, um, you know, she realizes that, uh, Gendo is going to destroy the world. He's going to do, he's going to do the big impact third impact. And so she tries to get the computer system to turn on him, but because the computer system, like one of it was like the, I guess they called like the woman part of her mom, you know, the one that seeks like romantic connections, that one betrayed her. So she was essentially betrayed by her mom's own love for Gendo, even though Gendo like cared about Rey more than her and like, you know, because he saw Yui in her, like that whole like complexity even though it was such a short frame was so interesting of like 
someone who is trying to seek out their like the memory of their mom, but still being betrayed by that memory is like so interesting. And it was a nice little yeah. tidbit before, you know, big impact, go boom. Right. And her thing is all about like, she loves her mom, but she hates her mom and she doesn't really understand who her mom was. Mm-hmm. And then in the end, she kind of becomes her mom. Yep. Yeah, exactly. That's like the most Eva <laughs> sentence. <I love> that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she loves her mom, but she hates her mom and she doesn't understand her mom, but then she becomes her mom. And that was my neon Genesis Evangelion. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So funny. Um, I saw in some of my reading while watching along just like I was saying, I was trying to make sure I was following the plot and everything that some people interpret. Um, well, they interpret uh, Kaji and Gendo as like the two different like paths that Shinji could take mm-hmm. as he like grows into an adult, um, which I think makes like a certain amount of sense. Um, yeah. Either like remaining bitter and unable to connect with people or becoming like more self-assured and uh but then they said by the same token people also see um misato and ritsuko as like the two different like adult female archetypes that um asuka could become oh yeah i saw that i I think i've seen this comparison that one is a is a little less clear to me because with gendo and kaji there's definitely like the good path and the bad path yeah but misato and and ritsuko are both Definitely just, like, both fucked up. Yeah, Yeah. that's where I'm kind of, like, I think it's, like, you know, where are we going on the lines of, like, who's good and bad when, like, everyone in this cast has so many shades of gray? Like, you know, there's so many different paths that it seems like, you know, no one here is except maybe Kaji, like, really is, like, accepting and loves themselves. So it's, like, which path are we supposed to be recommending? Right. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I guess, like, the one, like, good female influence in the show would be Yui. <laughs> and she but dies. So. Obviously, she dies. obviously, we see very little of her. Yeah. I mean, she has to be so good that uh, Gendo wants to recreate the world for her. Yeah. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> yeah. It has to be worse. So and we, we do see the scene in that like flashback episode that's like it's told from Fuyuki's yeah. point of view, but it's really mm-hmm. about like young Gendo and Yui. Um yeah. where when she's deciding that she's going to like integrate her soul into Unit Zero One, and Fuyuki's like, Why are you doing this? And she like points to baby Shinji and she's like, It's all for his sake. Like yeah. because this is the best way I can think of to create a better world for him. Yeah. Yeah. I don't <laughs> Surprise, know. Yendo cares about her son. <laughs> actually, actually, what is not clear for me still, but I'm not sure if it's supposed to be clear, but still, just why Yui kind of made up with Gendo in general, like what she found so enthralling with him that she would fell in love with him and mary that's yeah that's that's kind of odd especially since fuyutsuki himself again flashback was told with his pers- from his perspective that he did not really see gendo as an upstanding guy he was kind of a hooligan he was kind of a rebel and a very weird guy who yeah just Kind of. I think he says at one point in the episode, like, I just can't bring myself to like this guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, somehow... and then later he's having a conversation with Yui, and she's like, by the way, I'm going out with Gendo. Yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. like, what? Yeah. I think that was, I think the point of that is like, it is supposed to be confusing, but I think it's supposed to show that like, even someone as much of a like, unsociable bum as Gendo can find someone who like, truly loves him. So I think it's yeah. supposed to be more inspirational than logical. <laughs> yeah, and maybe just the ground for Gendo to be driven insane when Yui chose what he chose. Yeah, made her choice, basically. Yeah, for someone who's such a miserable bastard, like, Gendo really gets there with the ladies. Yeah, yeah it's so true. weird how... That's the real... See, here's a question for me. It's not, how did he get Yui? It's how did he get... Yui, um, Risako's mom, and then her. Like, he got all of them. Like, why would you hook up with a guy who hooked up with your mom? Like, 
what do you, how broken are you? You know, maybe right. that's why she's more broken than Misato. Cause even Misato is like, nah, fam, no, we're, we're not <laughs> right. pulling that, not pulling that trigger. But he's yeah. like, yeah, how is this dude getting with everyone? So I guess that's the biggest question of Neon Genesis Evangelion is how does he have game? <laughs> <laughs> it's that beard. It's the, it's the look. It's the, it's the pose. Yeah. He, he crosses his fingers and looks over his hands at you and, it's all over. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I want How that. Can you say no. <laughs> want that approval? Yeah. It's so. Yeah. It's a really interesting dynamic with everyone. Um, you know, in true Neon Genesis fashion, I feel like we should. We have to. We do have to talk about Ray. I think we have overlooked her at this point in true That's Ava true. fashion. Um. So I appreciated Ray a lot more in the rebuilds, especially the meta aspect of everything. But so I would be lying if I said that Ray left a strong impression on me just watching the TV series and End of Ava. I hope you guys have more to say because I, mean, I don't know. I mean, I feel like it's a point. No, Ray is not a character, and I feel like it's a point. She is not yeah. a real character, and uh, she is an artificial, uh, how do you call it, a doll, I guess, uh, who is created from Yui cells and uh, that's kind of it she is a tool she is a clone and she cannot have any feelings or even i mean she kind of develops some i guess very 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 rudimentary yeah i think you're being unfair to ray her a bit big moment in end of eva is when um like gendo brings her down to central dogma and they're standing in front of lilith and he's like all right this is the moment that you were created for like bring me back to Yui. And then she turns to him and she says, I'm not your doll. And she like rips his arm off. True. Yeah, I guess, I guess at the end, yeah. And the end of Evangelion, yeah, it happens. Yeah, true. But still, for the most part, especially compared to rebuilds, uh, she is very much a doll and the character who is just kind of there, who just kind of follows the orders, who is here to puzzle Sinzi uh, about her purpose about who she is and every other character as well, I guess. And uh, sure, she does not leave much of an impression, especially I was so puzzled the, after the first watch why she's more popular than Asuka, especially mm -hmm. in, like the East in Japan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, because she just kind of wasn't like any kind of character, but... I guess, like, again, as a kind of meta narrative, it kind of makes sense overall. Just she's just so lifeless, so plastic, so unnatural. Uh, because, again, she is a clone, and because she is kind of this um, weird uh, mirror of uh, their character as well, that uh, kind of uh, does nothing, but. Uh, just got kind of done, that does nothing, yeah. And is doing that, is, isn't doing anything. And uh, that's about her character and sums up. And uh, I, I don't even know what add, to add here because uh, mm -hmm. she kind of serves the plot and uh, that's, that's it. That's it. I don't know. I feel like it's unfair to compare Asuka and the Rage just because they serve such different purposes in the plot in mm -hmm. general and like uh yeah that's that that's about it i i think actually that the whole point of ray as a character at least obviously she's very important for the story is sort of to compare her to asuka and also to shinji like she's really the foil for those two characters um because there's a, a lot of the early part of the series before Asuka shows up is Shinji kind of watching Rei and seeing that, oh, clearly my father likes her way more than he likes me. So he's kind of trying to get to the bottom of what her deal is. Like, what's her relationship with Gendo? Why does she pilot? the eva um 
and he doesn't really ever get any satisfying answers out of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it it sets his kind of wheels in motion um, about what his whole character arc will turn out to be. And then later, once Asuka shows up, there are a lot of scenes of interaction between the two of them, including, of course, the famous elevator scene. Yeah. Um, um. But Asuka, Asuka, her go-to insult towards um, towards Ray. At first, she calls her Miss Perfect, but then once Asuka starts getting a little bit unhinged, she starts insulting Ray by calling her a doll, which is very much tied up with Asuka's own backstory. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like her her mom, like going crazy and thinking that the doll was her daughter and everything. Um, I Asuka very much sees Rey as, like, exactly what she doesn't want to be, but what I think she's afraid that people see her as or want her to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so Asuka... Asuka wants to be hot shit and have everyone think that she's the coolest thing ever, but she's afraid that people are just keeping her around because she's useful. Yeah. Um, And then once she stops being useful, then they have no use for her anymore, which kind of, like, confirms her fears. Yeah, I like that I like that input, too, because I do think that, like, comparing Rey to Asuka and Misato is kind of like the core of the show because Shinji's relationship, I think Shinji's relationship with those three women is kind of like the fundamental basis of his character and like every type of relationship he's trying to build with them goes wrong in so many different ways, you know, from like him and Misato both kind of trying to find themselves and not really being able to provide that kind of like familial relationship or like, you know, guardian uh adopted guardian re- guardian e i don't know uh like yeah. you know that relationship shinji and asuka trying to be friends classmates lovers whatever and then shinji's weird thing with ray of like trying to get along with her and trying to make get along with her as co-pilots and teammates but also having that weird connection that we will later find out is because like you know it's his part of his mom is in that so like it's not like he looks at her in a maternal way but it's just that weird kind of way that he's drawn to her that he's trying to figure her out but it's weird because she gives him nothing to work with so like he's trying to form some kind of relationship with her and it's just it goes nowhere as opposed to like someone being confused or just absolutely abrasive so it's interesting to see in that regard um so funny i don't know i don't know if it's funny enough but the elevator scene with Asuka and Ray is probably the first time I really like started connecting with Asuka on a really deeper level. Um, and it brought out like the really toxic 14 year old in me because I remember <laughs> when I was growing up, I remember it's like, you know, those times in like middle school where like you're kind of trying to like find who you are and your role and everything, but you're also looking for approval from your peers, just like the Neon Genesis Evangelion characters. And I remember having this period where like, I really wanted approval and attention for like having a distinct personality. And I was afraid of kind of like Oscar, like I was afraid of just kind of being like this blank doll who like, you know, didn't leave an impact on people. But then I would see people who in my head, I would toxically deem as like, you know, not trying as hard, not giving any kind of like personality, not trying or doing anything. And they would get so much more attention from like guys or just like other people our age. And I would be like pissed off that people were being recognized who weren't leaving an impact or were boring or like not putting forth as much effort as I was to like be noticed. And when Asuka was like calling Ray a doll, like, you're just a puppet. You're a doll. You leave nothing. I'm like, yo, that was me when I was 14. I was that toxic. Holy shit. Like, <laughs> damn. The only difference yeah. is I didn't say anything. Ooh. And I think that kind of like, you know, it was just this visceral reaction I had where like, damn, like she really just resents that she's trying so hard in every aspect for affection, approval, validation to be like the best pilot. And she sees Ray keeping up with her. And in her mind, she's like, 
this girl isn't doing anything. How is she getting, like, how is she getting any approval? And she's still, like, the commander's favorite. So it's, like, that weird, like, hatred for her feeling like she's doing nothing is, like, a core part that I see Shinji and Asuka having for a different level, for different reasons. Because Shinji is, like, this girl's not even related to my dad, as so he thought. And, you know, he's her favorite. Like, this is just so fundamentally frustrating. So, I mean, I think that says more about Asuka and Shinji, which is kind of unfortunate, but yeah, it is exactly. kind of like... Yeah. We're, talk- we're talking about Asuka and Shinji again more than Rei. That yeah. says about Rei a lot, I believe. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, it's... No, you're not, you're not wrong. <laughs> you're not wrong. It is kind of by design to a certain extent, but I think she is kind of like... In a very weird way, she is kind of like the catalyst for everything, even though that doesn't really speak much to her person. In a way, yeah. In the dynamic, yeah. She kind of yeah. exists, but at the same time, people are being openly frustrated with her, especially with her mm-hmm. lack of reaction. And yeah. uh, it only makes the situation worse in the end. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's an in- she plays an interesting role. And as you said, it's kind of like... um. Why is she being so kind of like idolized in Japan? Yeah. I have no idea. I have no idea. But in the same way, I don't know why Asuka is... I mean, I get a bit more... I understand a bit more, but it is kind of like... Y'all should really not be waifuing these characters. I kind of understand why Rei is being waifuized. Because she's so timid. So... so uh, mm-hmm. How that... How's the word? Uh, submissive. Submissive. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's probably why. And uh, it's very reductive portrayal of her, mm-hmm. but I guess fans don't care. They just see a pretty girl <laughs> and uh, they just want her to be her wife. I don't know. I don't, I don't really understand it either, but I kind of get uh, sentiment here, I would say. I mm-hmm. don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I, I'm, not really, I'm not a fan of Rey at all in general. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, I kind of get your uh, uh, place in the story in the plot, but all all in all, as a character, she just kind of does not really exist, especially on the same level as other characters. Yeah, um, slight tangent, but did you guys ever see the? music video by Anno's studio made in 2016 called Me, Me, Me. I did not. No. Okay, so I will just speak to anyone who has seen it, but I would recommend watching it after this podcast because it's a very interesting but, like, kind of disturbing music video short, like, on, um, like, the kind of escapism and sexual addiction that, like, weebs can have with anime and... Oh. It's very, it's very interesting and very powerful for like, I don't know how long it is, like two or three minutes, but at some point, um, it show it shows essentially this guy who's just constantly watching anime with like the figures and stuff, just kind of like repeating the process and getting lost in like the sexuality of everything. And at some point he's like trying to get away from his screen and he's like running away from like this monster in his computer screen and he look and he falls back on his this shelf and it has all of the Ava girl figures and they're all looking at him demonically and knowing that this is like Ano's studio I feel like it's another way of being like stop waifuing the psychopaths <laughs> like stop waifuing them <laughs> like yeah. stop doing this but it's this very weird um I think anime in general just has this very weird relationship with the themes of escapism because it's like half the time they're trying to warn people like, you know, don't rely on escapism, don't rely on fantasy, which is, I think, a pretty big theme of Ava. Like, you can't escape into, yeah. you know, recreating your wife. You have to, like, accept reality. You mustn't run away. Yeah. You mustn't run away. Yeah, like, you have to accept reality. You have to accept everyday life. But then there are so many escapist elements to it that can be fed into, like, waifuing the Ava girls like that seems so counterintuitive to the message but there are so many parts that can just be I guess people can just ignore it and waifu them anyway even though I think it beats the Mm. beats the message over your head a lot of like these aren't real they were never real they're barely real in the story you should not (laughs) idolize this in any capacities so it's always tough with anime because it's like half the time they're 
presenting a really compelling message, but then half the time they're feeding into it, sometimes at the same time without even realizing it. Yeah, that's really interesting. I will link um, that me, me, me in the description for the video. Yeah, yeah I'll try and link it to you guys because some, sometimes, okay, yeah, I think I found it. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's not safe for work because <laughs> it deals with it deals with waifu and shit. So, yeah, I will link it to you guys. But yeah, um, yeah, I I was late on it. I think a lot of people know about it. We might be one of the like later ones finding out. So I think other people do know, but we can link it anyway. But um, yeah, I've yeah. definitely seen people talking. about Yeah, yeah, it. I also yeah. heard about it, but never really watched it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, I think the reason for all of that, if we have to find one obviously you know it's missing the point but i think the reason people latch onto it as hard as they do is because ava is like a very sexually intense show mm -hmm. true you know like it has an actual sex scene in it at, yeah. which was very controversial at the time it came out yeah um, like airing on television in like 1995 japan um and uh you know, even aside from like Misato and Kaji's sex scene, there is like a lot of like very explicit sexual tension between um, Shinji and Asuka, and not in like an anime fan service kind of way, but in yeah. a like oh, <laughs> like I don't know how to word it, but <laughs> very you know, like when emotionally you, when intense. you see mm -hmm. like. A horny anime yeah it feels pretty far removed from anything resembling like real world sex sexuality yeah mm -hmm. but it, it's very it's not like that neva it feels very raw and very real yeah sure. yeah um i think it's one of my favorite series in how it portrays sexuality um i mean I think it does a really good job. I think especially nowadays we can be like, you know, this handles things very mature and authentically, but um, I've seen and heard some people take issue with like, I mean, I think it's I think it's clear that they're kind of portraying it the same way a 14 year old boy would think of things like, you know, when they show, you know, I don't I don't even know what I'm to say, but you know, like when uh Asuka is first introduced and she's in the same room as Shinji and there's like the scene where she like rolls over and she's in his bed somehow and it's like he's looking right at her chest but then they have a shot of like his eyes and he just sees her like I think that's really authentic because at some point you do have to show like you know there's sexual feelings involved especially if that's part of the themes of the show but I, I saw someone recently complaining about how like oh, the show is too horny, like, this is, like, the horniest thing I've seen. And that's how I knew they hadn't seen much, much anime, is because they said that this show <laughs> is, like, one of the most horny series. But, but, the, but I can definitely understand that because of what I was just saying about, like, yeah. you know, horny anime, to me at least, doesn't feel like real sex. Yeah. You know? But Ava does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I heard a funny story about when they... Uh, when Ano had to pitch the sex scene with um, with uh, Kaji and Misato, uh, I think he had to tell everyone it's like he's giving her a back rub, like it's not <laughs> yes, or foot yes, rub, yes, it's I not sex. That. It's a, it's a very it's a back rub, which is really funny that that passed in any capacity. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> there was just enough plausible deniability for the studio. <laughs> yeah, like oh Misato, I didn't know you still smoked. Oh yeah, I only do it when I'm getting a back rub. <laughs> Yeah, I only yeah. do it after my background. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I There's think a line there too when he's like handing her the like microchip, the secret information on there, where mm -hmm. she says like, she kind of like squeaks and then says like, don't put that up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's so funny. Um, right. It's so funny in retrospect, but I just always find it funny that like, I think I just don't think I mean it is horny but like I think the outrage is always kind of like I mean it makes sense but as you said I don't think it's like gratuitously horny I feel like it is very much based in like actual intimacy and sexual feelings right I feel but I, I could totally see how someone who's like not really comfortable with that in their media would not have a problem with like horny anime but would be very put off by the sex in Ava I'll go ahead and say that it probably, again, the extension of people do not want in, to see scenes in them, 
because lots of uh, adolescent boys in his age were behaving like that and trying to ogle girls as well, attractive girls, and they just do not want to admit that they were kind of creeps as well, just because they yeah. kind of they kind of just were interested in that, right? And they when they see Cindy, they just kind of have this opposite reaction because they kind of were like that as well. And it's kind yeah. of fine, I guess, for that age as well. But yeah. Yeah. I wonder at some point, when is it like the crossroads between tasteful portrayal of sexuality, especially as a teenager, and authentic portrayal of sexuality as a teenager? And it's like, you know, at some point you have to cross from one into the other, depending on what you're doing. And as you said, like, People just might not want to admit that, like, this is kind of, that's kind of how it is. Like, teenagers yeah. are not, like, they're not finding the best ways to be horny, like. Right. Know, they, <laughs> yeah, especially you know. since uh, so many serious in the past, in the present, and probably in the future, just are so oblivious to theme themes of sex in general, like characters in anime. Even older than Shinji, for example, like 17, 18 years old. They just do not yeah. know what sex is at all. They're just so clueless about it. And yeah, yeah when something like NG is throwing that sex right, like in your face, it's kind of a whiplash, right? Like, yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I do want to shout out here real quick um, Horemia as maybe the only anime I've ever seen with like very authentic and real feeling, like, and positive healthy wholesome teenage sexuality in it oh yeah you so, got me once you said wholesome and healthy that's when i was yeah. like i was about, i was ready with examples and then you're like whole wholesome and healthy i'm like okay i'm out we're done yeah we're, right. done. <laughs> we're down uh yeah and i think that's cool to see i gotta catch up on that um i think you know it's kind of interesting nowadays just because i could totally understand people kind of complaining about ava back in the day but we are living in a post game of thrones world where twins were having incest in the first episode and everyone still watched it so <laughs> I, as soon as i remember that i'm like yeah there's you cannot complain about the neon genesis evangelion horny once you've seen that and continued watching like Man. both are very important for the plot but i'm just saying like we all saw it we kept watching as a society so i mean gotta recognize. It's like to, i mean they just i just feel like it just kind of uh extension of what sex in my anime no yeah. <laughs> right moms against sex and anime mm. facebook yeah. moms against mm. sex and anime mm. yeah um <laughs> in my good christian anime yeah. <laughs> and they said neon genesis a like the evangelicals they have yeah. it in the title what yeah. it's so funny i could see some people thinking it's like like you know some kind of like christian or catholic or holy holiness and they're like what <laughs> what <laughs> so funny yeah um so i guess there is the one scene though that what do you i mean i think we all are gonna have a similar take on it but i do think that it's fair to kind of have some issue with this in in some cut in some capacity but the one horny scene that is that does actually piss people off is of course the end of evangelion uh hospital scene yes so i've yes. seen some people argue uh. that that ruins shinji's character um I think we we probably all disagree with that, but that is like the biggest point of contention I think for people with like the entire franchise. I would say that if you're going to level that sort of accusation at anything in End of Evangelion, it should be the scene where Misato kisses Shinji. But See, that's really, the thing is, it's I would, like I would say when he strangles Sasuke at the very end of the series, at the very end of the movie. We've On already proven my point wrong yeah. in 10 seconds. We've <laughs> proven it wrong immediately. And that's good to hear for, you I know, mean, when well, we're talking let, about let's, Ava. It's be, let's get to all of those scenes in turn, because they are all yeah. worth talking that's about. That's because the Evangelion is just so fucking weird, but in an amazing yeah. way. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I don't know, Shad, do you have thoughts about the I'm so fucked up scene? 
So the first time I watched it, I thought it was really funny. I didn't <laughs> yes, realize right. anyone was like morally outraged over it. I think there was something. Okay, so I got blocked by someone. Oh, on... oh first we've got to give the obligatory fuck Netflix for their, their their redub of the series that came out a few years ago, where they oh, change yeah. a bunch of lines, some of which are important, like when they erased the gay overtones from yeah. Kawaru, yeah. but also yeah. when they replace I'm So Fucked Up. They did replace I'm So Fucked Up, which is terrible. Um, we can also get back to the gay overtones at some point, but- in the meantime, we're so fucked up. Um, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I had the wrong reaction. I thought it was really funny. And I don't think they intended it to be funny in the context of the scene. I think you're supposed to be like, yo, okay. Well, I think at first when you see it, you're supposed to be like, did he just like do that? Does he like actually do that? And I think mm-hmm. that happened. And then I laughed. But I don't. Okay. I've gotten into not civil disagreements with people. I think it's a good character moment for him because I think it shows that he is really fucked up after the events of the entire series, which we've gone over. Like, he's beyond traumatized. He's looking for some form of, like, positive human interaction. Actually, not even positive. He just wants Asuka to talk to him because he's, like, beyond fucked up. And, you know, we the sexual tension between him and her has been established from the get-go. So I think... It makes sense given his level of trauma and, you know, their dynamic. Uh, I mean, I also think it's just like, I think it's fucked up, but I would also kind of agree that I don't think it's the most fucked up thing that happens in the movie or in the series. I think it's just like, yeah, that's, you know, I think it's a sign that like he's that crazy. So I don't, I'm not morally outraged. Um, I'm not, I don't think it's, I don't think it's that bad. Like when some people freak out, I'm like, guys, it's not that bad. Yeah, End of Ava spends a lot of time and attention on the incredibly toxic codependence between those two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that this just, like, uh, just so gross, um, disturbing opening to, like, the f- the first time they're in the same space together in the movie is, like, perfect for showing just how uh just just how fucked up not only he is but just like their relationship is Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know i i'm not really a big fan of the scene honestly mostly because it just it just that one moment when i cannot really relate to scenes i guess because (laughs) i don't know i I feel like i don't know it's just so so kind of I kind of guessed what Anna was going here for and like the intention behind it that uh, Sinji is just so confused and he has had that all his feelings are kind of a mess and uh, sexual arousal comes along with uh, hatred, with uh, uh, disapproval, with uh, I don't know affection and something like that and when he sees Asuka so defenseless, I guess maybe it kind of provokes a reaction, but at the same time, I'm just probably too normal for this to understand, <laughs> so I kind of do not really understand it, so yeah, I don't know, it's weird. Mental health flex. I'm not that fucked up, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I don't know. I, 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 yeah. I'm trying. I'm trying my best to be this fucked up, but I cannot. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think it's like he saw her boobs when she, like, turned over. And I guess that... I, it is kind of, like, very extreme that, like... Yeah, he, he's, went, like, shaking her, trying to wake her up because she's comatose. And, and he, then, like, yeah. rips her shirt open. And then he sees boobs, and I guess that's enough that it's like, yeah, we're doing this now. Like, it's very, <laughs> it's very, it's a huge jump for sure. I think it makes sense, but I do kind of see what you mean, where it is kind of like, yeah, they just really like yeah. threw that in there, and then such an extreme thing all in the course of the series. But yeah, um, well, yeah, I mean, we have what we have, yeah. But <laughs> we have end of Evangelion. <laughs> yeah. So what about Misato Sin? Yeah. <laughs> Next progressive scene. Who? Wait, who said that? Sinrus? Was that you? Yeah, Sinrus. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I really dislike that scene. Like, you dislike <sighs> it because... So, we, you know, since it's Ava, it's like, it, do you dislike it because you dislike the context? Or do you, you dislike the utilization of, like, what they were trying to go for? <sighs> well, it feels like the continuation 
of what we were talking about earlier with how they treat Misato in the last couple episodes of the series, where they're like, mm -hmm. like the show's wrapping up, like we need to show that Misato has problems. Um, let's just retroactively say that she was like really horny. You know, like mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense to me that you know, after all the time she spent with Shinji and after the way they've interacted throughout the whole show that suddenly, like, after she's been shot and is, like, minutes away from dying, she's like, all right, now I want to fuck this teenager. Okay, I do. So I was, like, number one on the slander of, like, calling Misato a predator because I thought it was kind of funny because I think I think in the in true Ava fandom vein is, like, you have people having the waifu wars and then people are, like, well, Misato is not that bad, so she's got to be the best pick. And you're like, okay, no, Misato is still bad. She still has her toxic tendencies. Um, but the second time around, I was paying very close attention to see. I'm like, okay, how much of the Misato creepiness is evident in the series and then end of Evangelion? And I think they were. I don't think they were trying to say that she was like horny for Shinji. I think in that scene, it was trying to be like. She was trying so hard to motivate him to do something. Oh, She's trying yeah. to save his life because they're getting shot mm -hmm. and like they're getting mowed down. She got shot trying to save him. And she knows that he's their, la their last hope. So I think he was just so double fucked up. He's gotten like new levels of fucked up that she was trying to both wake him out of his situation and also motivate him in some kind of way. Like, I mm -hmm. think she was at wit's end and that was like her last ditch effort to be like, snap out of it and do something and also save your life. But I think it does kind of harken back to the idea that like, intimacy is the only way she could think of to try and get through to him, which mm -hmm. I think we, which I kind of agree wasn't as established as much as it was told here and there so it's kind of tough because it's like they don't show us her you you know using her own sexuality in other scenes so it's tough to have that as like a pattern of behavior but yeah. like i do think that was the intention and it wasn't her being like oh i want to fuck shinji yeah okay i agree I, yeah i like that interpretation i agree i agree pretty much on all fronts just want to say that i feel like misato was just trying to be courageous encourage uh Shinji to do what he's supposed to do, especially since mm -hmm. Shinji was visibly distraught and yeah. with Misato being shot as well. Like, even in that state, Shinji was kind of understanding that it's probably the last time he's able yeah. to see Misato. And uh, Misato wanted, wanted to make an impression and uh, a statement of sorts. And I guess, as uh, Sha just said, uh, that's about the strongest statements that she could could have done, especially since the words kind of did not mean that much at that point. So I feel like it's okay. I feel like it's it's a fine scene and it has yeah. its place overall in the story. And I understand it, even though maybe there could be some other ways to do it. I'm not sure, but ultimately I just do not really have a problem with it. Let's say yeah. Yeah, I was paying attention for... I was keeping my eyes open for Stranger Danger the whole time. So I was trying to pick up on it. And first time around, after kind of forgetting it a bit, I was like, you know what, that's kind of sus. But on rewatch, I was like, no, this is definitely like her trying to like, you know, get him... Try and mess with his mental fucked upness and trying to get him back into some form of normalcy by shaking it up. Okay, I gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I can I can come around on that. Yeah, it was. I'm. I was glad to have that takeaway too. Like, I was glad to like be proven wrong the second time around on it, and seeing like her what I think her actual intentions were. So like, it was a cool takeaway and cool to see it happen again. Um, cool to see it. I mean, cool to see what happens. But I think it was like a really powerful moment. Um, since also like the whole point is like her trying to get through to Shinji is like the entire show, and this was like. It was kind of sad that the only way she could really get through to him was through the toxic uh, coping mechanism she's always had. Right. Mm. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, the final scene. What are your thoughts? <laughs> we skipped over a lot, but yeah. Wait, who? Wait, who said the choking scene? That was Cav. Yeah, it oh, was, yeah, mine. was Cav. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm a bit confused still. Like I read some thoughts on it. 
I try to think mm-hmm. myself, and I'm still kind of, kind of puzzled, especially after all the, all the stuff that was happening this, during the third impact, right? Yeah. And uh, since it's the only human on Earth, and then Asuka appears, and the first reaction that he entertains is to choke her, strangle her. And that's, that's, that's odd, I guess. I don't know. But then he just kind of breaks down again. So maybe it's kind of a sentiment that no matter what, uh, I just cannot escape you. And <laughs> I just, even then I want to get rid of you. But I don't know. What else I on it? All right, so I'm glad we came around to this because it lines up with um, something that I wanted to ask you guys as uh, maybe the the final topic of discussion um, for this podcast. So I'm going to answer your question with a question, which was, do you think that in the end, Evangelion is like, do you think its message is trying to be uplifting or is it just like nihilistic? Um, I guess I'll go first since yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good, sure. way, good way of putting it. Um, I think it's both. And I think it is. It's uplifting in the sense that Shinji was able through instrumentality was able to come to the conclusion that he does value human interactions and that even if you can't get it right, the effort is worth it. Even though you'll get hurt, it's important to form these connections with people and it's important to have everyone be their own individual with their own absolute territory that prevents people from connecting, you know, hedgehog dilemma for preventing people from truly connecting. But I think the nihilistic harsh reality part comes in and that's where it's like he and Oscar are seemingly the only two people left in this desolate state and it's comes back to him in this rush of memories that you know all of the times he's hurt her that she's hurt him and it's he's you know thinking back to instrumentality where there are fights of both of them just like screaming at each other to try and understand each other results in him trying to strangle her which feels like the result of like all of the frustration over the series but um in that interaction he's strangling her because he can't cope with how much they've hurt each other and her reaction to gently caress his cheek is like kind of breaks him out of the shell to remind him that like you can have positive interactions with people even the person who is the most toxic to you who's hurt you the most who you've hurt the most they're, you're still able to kind of rebuild and find love there there's it's still a connection worth having and uh i think him breaking down over the rush of emotions of experiencing not just like love or hatred but both of them at the same time is why he breaks down and uh oscar's saying discussing is just like the cherry on top um i remember mm-hmm. hearing in a in an interview it was like ano to- asked the voice actress like you know how how do you feel about like if you were oscar and you know someone masturbated over your comatose body what would you say and it would be disgusting so she also has that delayed reaction and it just kind of shows like you know the toxic but complicated but worthwhile relationship they have. Mm-hmm. Um, mm, interesting. Oh yeah, Cap, go ahead. No, I, I, interesting. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, actually. I like it. Uh, I guess the overall ending, I feel like it's totally very different from uh, the series because the series is way more uplifting in, in general, especially with the famous, infamous whatever, however you want to put it, the congratulations mm-hmm. scene that is thrown everywhere around. It is probably one of the most recognized scenes in Evangelion, right? Yeah. And there is no congratulations scene uh, end of Evangelion. It's an apocalyptic performance of uh, basically everything ending and coming to a conclusion and... Uh, one can say that it's all returning to nothing. <laughs> yeah, and uh, 
when I see, again, uh, to kind of sidetrack a bit, End of Evangelion is a fucking kino. Holy shit. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's phenomenal. Like, it takes so much balls and I guess just uh, wit to portray this kind of third impact in this, in this insane way. It's like incomprehensible how you can come up, come up with this it's it's insane but it's it just looks so phenomenal overall especially the second half of the movie that's the brain splatter yeah mm-hmm. exactly and it's just so mind blowing and uh, when you see it uh like in the first person for the first time it just hits differently than the series again and Mm -hmm. uh, i feel like you just cannot it's very hard to come up with the same kind of conclusion as the series that it's uplifting uh at the very least i guess you could say that sinji is just in the at the start of a very long long journey journey to accept himself and uh, accept the world around him but as it's evident with uh, Asuka scene that he is still extremely confused and not sure how to approach it and what to do with it all because the world has ended and there is there is pretty much nothing around him. So yeah, I feel like it's a very in general open ending and that's why we have this kind of interpretations being like thrown around so i would say overall it's fairly still negative ending just because of the not even the message but the overall atmosphere and the overall just energetic around the scene like it just Mm -hmm. it just feels very not even negative, but uh, uh, confusing and uh, uh, just, I don't know, just kind of strange, I guess. Uh, it's the same ways of the whole movie fails. And mm-hmm. uh, I don't know, it's, it's hard to even come up with this like one mood, one thought to describe it. Yeah. yeah, I think so. My take on the end of the end of Evangelion <laughs> um, is that you know, we were taught as we were talking about with the um, the I'm so fucked up scene earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, the relationship between those two as it's focused on in that movie is very much about like their completely unhealthy codependency. Um, and kind of the, the plot events of the movie. And this was the one place where my attempt to like follow what was happening in the story, I think really paid off for me. Um, it's about like, Shinji is put into the position where he's the one who gets to like decide the fate of humanity because he's in the Evo when yep. instrumentality begins. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's the whole like internal scene of him um, like talking with the other characters uh, as like giant Ray Kawaru angel being is trying to figure out like what he wants um where which includes like the first strangling scene um and incidentally i've got to shout out the incredible story from that scene where apparently when they were recording um the the dialogue between um shinji and asuka there the voice actors got so into it and so emotional that Shinji's voice actress like actually almost killed Asuka's. Oh, <laughs> holy Whoa. shit. Like, That's wild. Like actually almost strangled her to death. Whoa. Oh my god. That's wild. Um, 
but the what what happens in that first strangling scene is that it's basically like Shinji, who is at like the lowest point a person can possibly be, the lowest of just, the low one might say, and by yes, that, the lowest and by of that the, one, and by that one I mean Netflix subtitles, Netflix specifically, Fuck you. right? <laughs> um, he's like begging out to the rest of the cast for like someone to help him, someone to save him, someone to just like make all of his pain go away. Um, and the instrumentality ghost of Asuka refuses to do so. She's like, I'm, I'm not going to bail you out here. Like you're, you disgust me. Like, I know you've been like jacking off to me. It's like, fuck off. I don't want anything to do with you. And then he like strangles her in the dream and says to like the, um, to Lilith or whatever that entity is like, I don't want to exist anymore. I don't want anybody to exist anymore. Like just let it all end. And that's when she starts like turning everybody into LCL and, uh, all, all returns souls. to nothing. Yeah. I, like it all returns to nothing starts playing. Um, but then, you know, as people say that like the, um, the last two episodes of the original series are happening like during end of Ava. Um, and that, that is the point at which, uh, those episodes take place. Right. Yeah. So instrumentality has happened to all of humanity is like united into a single organism. Yeah. And Shinji realizes that like, it's actually just a really, sad and lonely way to exist that mm -hmm. there's nobody he's united with everybody there's no way left for um you know anyone to hurt him but there's no longer any way he can like define himself or any existence aside from him left in the universe and he comes to a realization that that isn't what he wants that even though it's painful and has never worked out for him in the past that uh it is still better to try to connect with other people and to try to find a way for you know him to achieve uh human happiness um at which point he rejects instrumentality and decides to like return to human existence mm -hmm. and what i think is so striking about the ending is that it's it's uplifting in that the message is like no matter how bad things get the better choice is always to keep trying you know, it's never correct to just give up on existence mm -hmm. but it also never says like yes now things will all be good and happy for shinji or anybody else Mm -hmm. You know, he he decides to keep trying, but it ends with him like face to face with Asuka once again and still like not being able to process any feelings toward her except like by attacking her again. Um, it, it's a, a mixed message, but I ultimately think it's it's more on the uplifting side than not that it. It's saying, you know, you might never figure it out, but it's always worth it to keep trying. Mm hmm Yeah. That's fair, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it feels more authentic because it's a mixed message. Like, instead of being one or the other, it's both, like, simultaneously, which is why it's so frustrating. You know, it's like, it's always better to keep trying and to keep putting forth the effort because you might achieve happiness because giving up is worse than not trying. But that doesn't mean you're going to automatically achieve happiness or like immediately form that connection, even with people who have really hurt you. Right. And that's like, you know, the congratulations scene. What mm -hmm. people are saying congratulations in response to, you know, Shinji's last line before then isn't like, oh, I don't hate myself anymore. It's I've realized that it's possible that maybe someday I can figure out how to love myself. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that that, you know, people talk about how Ava 
is very much a reflection of Anno's own like mental struggles. And that speaks to me so truly as the mm-hmm. work of someone who is like deeply depressed that the uplifting ending is maybe someday things will get better. Mm-hmm. Not things are better for me now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, th- I think that that's what makes it so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Think, 100%. Things cannot change 100, 180 like immediately, especially in this case. But it just feels like, again, just the way how End of Evangelion was presented, it's just really hard to kind of uh, see it as an uplifting message, I guess. It's just so <laughs> layered, deeply like hidden and layered behind this all this catastrophe of the world ending so it it takes effort to say it it is here but you do not really take away that everything is going to be all right after this i guess that's what i'm trying to say right but it is like one of the last lines of the movie is i think it's yui's voice saying like you know as long as the earth and the moon and the sun exist then everything will be daijobu Mm -hmm. daijobu (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there, yeah. There's always hope, basically. Yeah, it's I think so powerful, and I think that's why it sticks with everyone so much because it's kind of like the harsh reality mixed in with the uplifting message, which makes it feel so real. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. On that note, is there anything else you guys would like uh, to say about it? The original the one, Ava? Well, since we kind of went through all the issues that we had, well, not the issues we had, but like the potentially most offensive scenes in End of Evangelion, I want to talk about the least offensive scene, as in one of my favorite scenes of all time, and one of the best fight scenes ever, and that would be the Asuka versus oh, yeah. Rebuilds fight, which is just absolutely one of the best scenes i've seen in anything one of the best fights one of the best an- pieces of animation period um it's fantastic it has that mixed message of feeling hype and like exciting also tied in with oscar's like you know unsettling sense of bravery and you know courage which is you know results in one of the most horrific scenes that i mean i think i've seen in anime just an absolute roller coaster of a scene, um, absolutely perfect and groundbreaking. Kino, fa- peak fiction, everything, zenith of the medium, just like best shit of all time. So, yeah. shout out, shout out to everyone who made that and their family. Hundred percent agreed. Yeah. yeah, the the mass produced Davas are like they're so disturbing. They're so terrifying. Why do they have teeth? <laughs> no one needed that. We didn't need that, but they still have it, and it's terrifying. Uh, the shot of us. them all, like, growing their wings and then descending on her after she's been impaled by the Spear of Longinus and, like, tearing her apart with their teeth, and then the shot of, like, the mutilated corpse of Unit Zero Two and everything. It's so disturbing. It is, yeah. Yeah. Very in line with uh, the movie, yeah. It's a very powerful scene. But... Uh, I want to go all the way back to the episode one, actually. And it's probably my favorite episode of the series, actually. I really love the first episode. And mm-hmm. the way how it's directed as well. Uh, the way how Sinji is being presented before his father for the first time in years. And how he emotionally, emotionlessly says that basically, yeah, you just need to get into the robot. Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> All these shots of him, of uh, Gendo Ikari, and you know, this kind of monitors behind him and uh, Sinji's face uh, and his like replies to him, and uh, how when he refuses and Ray is being brought into the scene while she's being still on the bed, on the hospital bed, basically, not being able to move pretty much, and uh, how he, how Sinzi essentially still gets to the robot because, because he has no other choice. It's just such a powerful first episode that sets the, the scene, the 
everything for this series. It's, it's incredible. And I feel like one of the strongest uh, aspects of it, and like one of the best recognitions, is it's basically remade fully in the rebuild. It's like one to one uh, in terms of uh, storyboarding. Like it's the same. And mm -hmm. uh, it's just so, just so powerful. Like just how it's all sequenced and presented. It's incredible. I really love the first episode. Yeah, that reminds me. I don't remember if it was in the first or second episode, but you know how people talk about like the elevator scene um, and other scenes in the uh, the last few episodes of like when the budget was entirely gone for the show and everything. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I was realizing that you know those like long still shots and awkward silences really are there from the very beginning. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and and Definitely. either the first or second episode, there's a scene where Shinji is with Misato, and they're going to like step into an elevator, and the elevator doors open, and Gendo is on the other side of it, and there's one of those like long, still, silent shots of yeah. the two of them just looking at each other through the elevator doors, and nobody says anything, nobody reacts at all, <laughs> and then the doors shut again. Yeah, yeah, and that's I think that's the whole two. scene, but it's like. That's, it's so powerful. Yeah. Yeah, there's, like, so, I mean, I, it's kind of a given, but, like, there's so much powerful directing throughout the series that, like, a scene like that where, um, you know, the, where it says so much without saying anything, like, that doesn't need to be, like, a Sakuga scene where, like, they're animating every small detail, you know, that direction, and, like, storyboarding just says it all. Like, that's their relationship, and then portrays everything because you know words wouldn't really do it justice mm -hmm. um and there there's so many shots throughout the series that you can pinpoint where you're like okay this is a thousand words in like one shot yeah. right <laughs> it's kind of funny too in retrospect looking back at that scene like so when you see it the first time you're like oh you know what is gendo thinking and you think it must be something like horrible and dismissive and whatever but you know, probably what Gendo is actually thinking is like, oh, shit, what do I say to him? Yep, yeah, like yep. he's so awkward and he feels yeah. so unworthy of being a dad. He's probably like, I'm going to do this guy a favor and not say anything. Where Shinji's like, why do you hate me? I'm sorry I'm born. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's so funny seeing the different perspectives. Huh. Huh. Yeah. Ava. Ava. And that was my Neon Genesis Evangelion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have one final point to make. Mm -hmm. which is that this is as far as I'm aware there have been so many goddamn millions of Ava spinoffs mm -hmm. and to my knowledge there has never been a single one about those three technicians who just sit in their HQ and like yell the plot all the time yeah I like them I they're love good those as, guys <laughs> yep. they're like great side characters for yeah. like like actual side characters who don't receive that much de like development or attention or like any kind of spinoffs or anything, but they do like so much with so little. Like they're just so memorable. They're so cool. They're so chill. And I would love to see like you know I'd love to, I'd see an episode or two on them. Like yeah, yeah why it's not? like all their deaths in End of Evangelion are just like they're so simple as befitting characters who aren't developed that much, but they have mm -hmm. just enough to like feel like they're wrapping up a very small character arc. Yeah. yeah yeah and it says a lot like when they because you i think the most important person to them is who shows up to tang them um to tango so to speak oh, right oh um so like that also says a lot about like who they value and what relationships they, they have with those people that we've seen throughout the series so right. does a lot in a short amount of time they're um, great side characters i can't believe there has never been a spinoff about them <laughs> if there has and you, listener, know about it, let me know, because I want to consume that. Yeah. Uh, give us, let us know if we've missed anything. Um, because I mentioned it, like, two hours ago, and I get kind of, like, pissed off when I hear someone say, like, we'll talk about this later, and then we don't talk about it later. Oh. Um, you, It's last comment, so we'll wrap it up. But uh, remember when you said, you're like, I don't think too many series have been too um, impacted by Ava, like, recent series? Because we were talking oh, yes. about, like... Yeah, um, got to give a shout out to Gridman and Dinozenon because I think 
those two series have done a great job of capturing the everyday mundane life interplayed or interspelled with like giant robots or like end of the world type catastrophes. And you can tell like so many scenes have been taken just like directly from Ava, but also just like the a- aesthetic and scope of them. So well, Grid- Gridman is like a sequel to a-, a mecha show from like the pre Ava era. Yeah, but there's like some scenes like there's like literally one of the scenes is like the exact same, like especially the um, Akane episode, like the inter like the That's Akane yeah. episode, like those two. I think it's not so much that they're like literally Ava. It's that they capture the atmosphere or like focusing on the slice of life aspects as much. And then how that is correlated to like the big robot catastrophes, which That's, might definitely. That's true. Yeah, which and might they definitely poke be fun at it too. It's like a Gridman yeah. sidekicks are called like the Neon Genesis High School students. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. they're they're so, like all adults. Yeah, exactly. And so there's definitely some like pre Ava stuff there too. But that's the, those are the two series that I think have like really highlighted like this is how you do an Ava influenced series well compared to like you know how people were like oh it's Starling and the Franks it's gonna be Ava or Gurren Logan but it's not neither of those so like you know. Yeah, so that was the thing I said two hours ago. If anyone else gets frustrated by that, um, that's what I was referring to. I'm glad I didn't leave you hanging, but if no one cares, sorry for dragging this out for another, like, five minutes. (laughs) All right. And on that note, uh, we will wrap this up. Stay tuned in the coming weeks for our uh, episode on the Ava Rebuilds. I don't think it's going to be our next episode, but it will be coming soon, so be ready. I, as of the time of recording, have still not actually seen 3.0 plus 1.0. Oh. So I'm really, really so excited to get to it. you cannot record until, <laughs> <I know. yeah. laughs> until you watch I, it. I'm really excited to get to it because I've heard literally nothing but good things, and that is not at all how I expected it to be received. So that means it's got to actually be good. Yeah. Maybe. That, that's what You'll find the out. word on the street. I, we might be on the street. Me and Cav might be part of the street, but <laughs> that's the word on the street. <laughs> all right. Um, okay. On that note, thank you all for listening. We have been the Tokyo Podfathers. On that note, thanks for listening, uh, and we'll catch you next week.